try to get started in here. So, thanks for coming to our Warriors Corner. So, I'm Jennifer Swanson. I work for um, ASALT. I am uh, DASA DES, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Data Engineering and Software. We're going to do two big reveals today, which I am very excited about. So, I hope you guys are ready to hear the news. So, we've, we've been... Visionary in particular, 
And it's a good fit because again, we've got a lot of data across a lot of the business mission area, uh, including uh, personnel, logistics, force management, you name it. We, we, we're, we're all over the map in terms of all the data we've got. And we're going to be starting, uh, actually we're already technically getting started with our uh, CEO Mike Chappell. Uh, he's already been leaning in on our uh, program teams for all of our new start programs to make sure that they're building a services interface on top of these systems from day one. Now, the rationale behind that is that we want to get out of the point-to-point -point connection business, which is, as everybody probably here knows, frequently a delay point in a lot of projects, getting the SLA solved, getting all the whitelisting, and all those uh, issues are uh, approved. So we're already moving, I'd say spiritually, toward the data mesh with every one of our programs. <coughs> and we'll be looking for opportunities to go back <coughs> uh, and try to find a way to actually modernize those systems uh, into a data mesh compliant uh, form. But over the next year, we're going to look to try to find a way to accelerate the advent of data mesh. So what we're going to be doing is looking to see uh, if our uh, CEO of Mike Chapel can take the opportunity to start building out capabilities in concert with PUSC 3 t uh, especially on the tactical side. And what we want to do is jointly develop these uh, the capabilities, almost as a single capability with different uh, focal points. So for, the, for those of you who have read the data mesh documentation already, I think we're on version 4, which is, I guess, well, we, 1.0 is when officially got released. We're on version like 80 billion, but okay. 1.0 is what's on the street. Exactly, exactly. So uh, if you haven't read it, it, it is a good read because it really talks about how to set up the actual data architecture, but also has the discussion around the data mesh. And you will see, I think, now a very different army about the way we build systems. And we're very excited to be able to be uh, you know, leading the charge on that. I, as such, again, we, we've, uh, we're taking an uncharacteristic move here in that this particular PD will be reporting directly to our CIO and CDAO to make sure that this goes off without a risk. So, um, very excited. Now we do this. Awesome. Thank you, Bill. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I'll start by introducing myself, Mark Hitz. I'm the PEO for the Army's network. Um, and I wanted to start by embarrassing Jen a little bit. You know, AUSA is hard enough, right? It should be done in sneakers. And she, she's killing it right here. So, so me, I hope this is a trend-setting thing. We, we, gotta, we gotta make this more of a thing, I think. So I don't know if you've like seen any pictures of like fashion news, but it's been a thing for a while now, Mark. Okay. White All sneakers, right. not white. just sneakers. Yeah, I couldn't keep sneakers that white. That, would, that just wouldn't happen. So, so one thing Bill talked about was, was making the data mesh, a program around data. And that's a big deal. It's a big deal because now it's congressionally identified as a program, which for us, industry and government, it means that real money can get applied so that it becomes a real thing. We at POC3T have been doing data fabric, data fabric plus activities for the last three years as sort of a, and also a, a, another part of our job. And so why I share Bill's excitement is that we are actually going to do a tactical data mesh program starting in FY26 that's going to be appropriated as a separate program. We can tactically issue, we can tactically get to UDRA compliance, and we can service out data regardless of a new or legacy application. We can get to a tactical way to build our data mesh. To me, that's really important because we're always gonna have our legacy applications, or at least we're always gonna be in some process of offboarding our legacy applications. We're always gonna be looking at the next generation of data platform or next generation of C2 application, next generation of you name that mission command application. Now having a foundational capability where we can tactically invest in our data. Today it's a data mesh, tomorrow it might be some other way we service out data but having some way, some investment portfolio dedicated towards our data, I think is really exciting. It should be exciting for industry because we also pose a really unique challenge with our, with our somewhat sometimes connected environment. It is really different from the commercial application of a data fabric today. And so I think it's both a real exciting opportunity because it is real and it provides a unique sort of challenge to industry and so, what does that mean for you? Uh, here at Tim 12 there will be a topic 
right? That actual solicitation around our data mesh, around our data fabric, or I call it a fabric plus, right? How do we get towards a data mesh? Actual uh, solicitation for you to, to bid against and for us to look at actual implementations of a tactical data mesh. Uh, like Jen said, an actual uh, uh, impl reference, reference implementation has been announced so that we can measure openness. We can measure industry's ability to get after a tactical data mesh. I think that's really exciting. I encourage you to come to TEM12. Uh, we're gonna be doing one-on-one -on -one sessions. We'll be doing a TEM topic announcement uh, and then hopefully award a contract within six months of uh, TEM12. I think really exciting. I think a lot of discussion now about the Army, about the next generation of our command and control applications. The, at the foundation of the next generation of our C2 is how we service data and how we provide data to our tactical application. So I'm uh, really excited on, on both fronts. Uh, I think a, a great opportunity for both industry uh, and the government to get after our next generation uh, uh, way to handle data. Um, I, I'd also say that we can't service that data without investments in our tactical infrastructure. Um, and so you're gonna hear the Army talk a lot about CMOS and open standards of CMOS. And you're gonna talk, and, and the under talked about this this morning, which is our at service model for SATCOM radios and IT. And so how we're piloting out our radios and our network as a, as a service is another opportunity for us in industry to come to a relationship in what is means to how we buy the future of the IT infrastructure that will service out this data. Uh, and with that, I'll, I, I think I'll conclude and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Mark. So I'll, I'll just close by saying, I'm, again, you know, this has been um, a, a process for us with industry's feedback and we really, really appreciate all the feedback we got because without that, we wouldn't be where we are. We would not have um, something that I think we're all confident is implementable and implementable, which is critical from, from the start. So thank you. I know it takes time to do that. I appreciate all the time you're just um, Just to kind of um, follow up on one thing that Mark mentioned. So the openness piece is key for the Army. And, you know, MOSA, um, you're going to hear a lot more about MOSA this year from us. Um, this is the year of MOSA. If you heard Mr. Bain mention that uh, in a few talks that he, he's had. UDRA is MOSA for data. I mean, that really is what it is, right? So it provides that architecture that all vendors can build into and we can compete things and we can have multiple vendors delivering pieces and it's okay because there's something to build into which frankly is something that is ultimately had. We didn't have this. So this is the first. There will be more but you know we're kind of just, we're, we're trend setting here kind of like my uh, white sneakers but um, this is I think definitely the way to inspire competition and be able to really build a network that is integrated from the start um, as opposed to what we tend to do, which is kind of put it all together on the back end. So. If you want to put one more point on that. <clears throat> so while, while the funding hits and you know, we, we've got a problem for 2006, that's all getting involved because a lot of industry can do for us now. And in all of your solutions, make sure that you're following at least the industry open standards like the data, open API, and, and microservices. Those are all things that will help us start getting down the path. And even as you're like building out solutions um, in the next year or two, also keep giving us the feedback about how you see it uh, evolving. So we'll, we'll have a steady stream of RFIs out there as we operationalize this. But we really need your help. Like, it's going to be key for us to give us your best guidance on how to move this forward, even as we're working on those uh, long term. Um, but we're looking forward to working on that. Yeah, one of the real opportunities to, to, to exactly at what Bill was talking about is um, we're about to release an opportunity for 1012 around API orchestration in a tactical environment. Uh, so a lot of our openness is defined by how we, um, you know, get after APIs, how we define APIs and how we evolve those APIs. And so we're interested in industry's thoughts uh, using UDRA as sort of a foundation. Uh, how, how do you propose getting after orchestrating these APIs in a data mesh environment, that is a, a real opportunity we're going to have here in 1012, which is a foundational investment for us 
and getting after this data mesh. All right, so if anybody has questions, I think we might have a little bit of time, okay. Um. Thank you all for putting on this and talking about the data mesh today. I think Inkit is super excited about this. How does the contract vehicle change for a Cyber phase three company like ours with the open API and zero trust? on your timeline to 2026. Is that short or help? Okay. So I think it shortens it. I do. I mean, I think that this kind of puts everybody on an even foundation. And so you guys don't have to guess and we don't have to guess. Um, so to me, it shortens it. Yeah, I'd say whatever contract vehicle we have, we have to be able to iterate and adapt. Right? It can't be static in, in certain times. And so as we evolve our APIs, as we evolve our solution, and you evolve your solution as a phase three, we've got to do our contracts smartly so that we can adapt over the future. I think that, that's key for us. Hey, good morning. Just a quick question for the thread on zero trust. Uh, is that baked in natively, or is that part of what will evolve as the solicitation comes back? So, I mean, speaking from the UDRA perspective, zero trust is certainly baked in. Now, solutions, right, are still evolving. So, we will have to obviously fit solutions into that architecture. But zero trust is clearly the way that the Army and, and DOD are heading. Yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a bit of a cynic, so I apologize for that, right? Zero trust is something I, I have trouble defining. Which, which goes back to the point I made earlier, is that as we define zero trust, as we iterate on zero trust, I, I mean, I've seen some definition of zero trust that I could never afford in my entire portfolio, right? And so I think we've got to smartly iterate zero trust and, and get after the pillars as, as they apply to our programs. And I think foundational to that is a relationship between industry and the government that can adapt over time, that is not static contract with deliverables that are static over time but we can iterate in a much more agile fashion yeah so there are pieces so we're working right now with the PEOs to um, align all of the pillars of zero trust with what is really executable especially in mark's world right so at the enterprise i think it's fairly easy in the tactical environment we always have constraints so there are going to be things that we aren't able to get to and so it's really going to be about like what are the things that we can implement in the tactical environment um clearly we're all you know we, we want to be as, as cyber secure as we possibly can so but it's not going to be a hundred percent yeah and another interesting thing about when you're talking about zero trust implicitly it's got to be part of the fabric right because you can't have partial zero trust and then more than anyone else. Uh, so that's kind of the way that we're approaching things. Again, we, we as we review every architecture coming through the EOIS, we're making sure that we're moving in that direction. And I'm saying this certainly will be a part of it. Hi, Kevin Martin with Draft. Um, what is your expectations for contract start to get into a new environment? And then ATL. What is your best timeline that you guys are looking at? The day after award. <laughs> but uh, in seriousness, we are today, we're soliciting for unified network operations. My expectation is that we do award based on what capability you have today. Now, I'll help you get to ATO, I'll help you get to sort of these zero trust principles, but you know, in, in areas where I think there's maturity in the commercial industry, you know, we should be able to bring a, an MVP to bear very, very quickly. And, and Unified Network Operations is an example. Uh, ICAM is another example, right? Uh, uh, that it's not rocket science for commercial industry to do identity access management, right? So how do we leverage a commercial product and, and adapt it over time? Um, my hope is that where we can adapt these commercial products that we're very quickly getting to MVPs. So, one of the big pillars too is to really build this thing out using good old-fashioned agile as our, our, our approach that we're not going to try to build every aspect of it in day one we're probably going to do something simple like focus on the registry aspects of it and get that to the quick easy win get that up in the environment ato and then we'll roll up from there but um i can show you the one thing we will not do is a big bang where we try to 
to take every single requirement and roll it out in, we'll say one year, but it could go two years. So hopefully, uh, we're talking year time frame, not multi-year, hopefully. That'd be the goal. Good morning, Ted Cummings with uh, Millsoft, and the final EPI platform. Uh, the uh, Defense Innovation Board in February, I believe, published a paper about creating a, a big economy, mentioning integrations and APIs. But one thing they addressed is the cultural change needed for system owners and data, uh, authoritative data source owners to be willing to unlock, to change the culture to share data as, a, or, as opposed to hoarding it. Uh, this is a great announcement, but is there also an equal effort being applied to changing the culture of the data homes? Yeah, so we're, and so you heard me say it's not just ASALT, right? It's also now CIO and CDO. And so they've been helping us with the functional community that owns the data uh, to be able to make sure that everybody is kind of on the same page. So I do think we've evolved. I saw the DIP report. They talked to a lot of people, you know, so I think that's kind of a roll up of a lot of um, feedback. I don't think that's really specific to the Army. I think we've evolved a lot in the last two years. Um, but culture is always, you know, it's the culture is slow to change. I mean, that's just, you know, when you're, and we're doing a lot of things that are different than they were two years ago. So that does take a little bit of time to catch up, but I'm pretty confident that we're going to be able to get there. We're actually leading implementation of a 100-day user plan right now for Mr. Bang, which includes the logistics community and user pack and others to really be able to demonstrate using users and data owners um, what the power of UDRA is going to be. So I think that that will go a long way to be able to try to, you know, show others um, what can be done. Yeah, and another thing to consider too is that the very concept of what we're trying to do with UDRA and, and Data Mesh is the idea is federated but not siloed. And every bit as much as it took us a considerable amount of time to go down the Agile transformation pathway, this will be the same. But I think when you look at the federated model, I think it kind of reduces the anxiety about owning your data because the data owners will be distributed throughout. I'll speak over here. Um, yeah, so I, I, think, I think naturally the approach we're taking in the area should bring down some of the barriers and the need to protect the data. And ultimately, when you start really grading you know, the teams about how well you share data, not necessarily how well you protected your opinion. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get everybody's name, but I said a little late in the back of the crowd. But to the API question, um, I was texting my son, he's the Army's new HR data scientist. And so we're texting, he's like, hey, make me up with that guy. And he's got a solution up there at HR. Hey, uh, you, you had me at HR data scientist. <laughs> <laughs> sounds, he's the only sound, one. Sounds just, great. He just became the thing. All in. Three by the tag you're up there. Anyway, all in. All so, in. Um, but to the API, you've read the Bezos method for Amazon in the beginning. Make everybody work with their APIs. Don't try and go around because you're going around with weak points. People try and snag their way in around the API, you end up giving up your data. Right? You know, weak points you have cyber security problem. So besides, so I wanted to link you up with enough of this. Um, second, uh, to the, we have, I think the weak point uh, generally between what you're talking about is retrieving and having a centralized uh, um, use of data instead of protecting data. There are also lead points in between and, and it started in DOD a while back if you guys considered a moving target offense as, a, a, as the integrator between your data and the data service. Uh, normally, and this started back, I was a soft guy, we used to IP hop and triple wrap and fix and do kind of crazy things to, to send things to people. Um, there are companies out there that automated that process because normally like if you're able to do that in the defense industry to take down a virtual instance to move to, to ferry the process between the two is is possible to your point. Like to do that for a single network that I used to run would probably be three or four million dollars a year. Just do that. Every time you stand up, four to seven cutouts from the internet, hiding stuff in between instances, user proxy services. That has to be done manually. If you, Currently, everywhere else is done manually, but there are a couple of companies that out there that automate the process. But um, what that does is an automated MTD SD WAN provides you the security through virtual instances that are only up for the time that you need. So I just 
you guys ought to consider. Yeah, and I, I, I'll amplify one point that you made, which is um, the tactical implementation of a data mesh is so unique to how the commercial industry would implement a data mesh. And the cost model really scares me. Like, it really scares me. I can't license every edge instance of the Army to do a data mesh. I can't, I, I can't afford that model, right? And so I have to, we have to work together to come to how the Army could implement a mesh in an edge environment uh, that, I, that, we, that we honestly can afford. So as there are contract solicitations that Bill and I are putting on the street that include your components, that we're gonna we're gonna offer the opportunity for you to prove compliance or or or, or shape your investment. So it's not gonna be a static you are or you are not in the lab kind of thing. Right. Yep. One more question here, Jonathan Pierce. Get, you mentioned that uh, you drew one point is starting out with impact level impact level two focus. Is there a future growth into other impact levels that yeah. we can share? So we're working on IL-5 next. Um, we started with IL-2, and I'm just talking about the implementation, right? The implementation is on IL-2 because, frankly, it well it reduces the barrier for entry for industry. And so um, IL-5 would make it much harder. But we are moving to IL-5 now as well so that we can do more program of record and you know real data kind of um, as well. Well, thank you for your time. Appreciate you guys coming. And thanks for everything. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me? Can you hear okay? I'll try to be really loud. I usually don't have a problem uh, with volume this morning. Well, good morning, Warrior uh, Corner. I'm Don Stewart from the 
Program Executive Office for Simulation, Training, and Instrumentation. I work in the Project Manager Office for Cyber Test and Training. And this morning, we are going to talk multi-domain operations with a focus on experimentation, testing, and training. And we're going to we're going to narrate through a couple videos that we did down at uh, down in Orlando in the fall at the Inter Service uh, Industry Training Expo that is annually held down there. And we're going to show the key integration efforts of three systems all in the CT2 portfolio. But before I begin, let me introduce my tag team partners uh, from Stry. Helping me this morning will be Miss uh, Jennifer Gillum. She is the assistant product manager for XLCC, the Expeditionary Live Virtual Command Center program. That program is the key uh, key POR driving ATEX requirements for operational testing, for developmental testing, for operational assessments and demonstrations. Her, her, her partner back there on the computer is uh, Mr. Dave Amarillo. He's the XLCC product director. And, and to Jen's right is Mr. Troy Bedsole from, uh, from the Redstone's Threat System Management Office, all part of PMCT2. And I actually just rolled off the, the Intelligence and Electronic Warfare Tactical Proficiency Trainer Program, but integrating these programs is going to reduce risk for ATEC as we look to test, and then ultimately we have to train modernized kit. So in our time together again, as I said, we're going to walk through two, we're going to narrate through two videos and just show what we're doing to uh, support and build a multi-domain operational testing and training environment. And as I said, this is key. It's gonna be tested and delivered, then we've gotta train it. So we'll do that at, at, the, at the division and core home station sites and the combat training centers. And that really feeds into the AUSA theme this morning of providing continuous transformation to deliver combat ready forces. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Jen to talk you through our first scenario. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. I look forward to the opportunity to speaking with you today on multi-domain operations and what we're doing at the, the CT2 PM office. So um, I will take a short video just to talk through how our three programs of record work together. And then I'll hand it over to Mr. Bedsell to, to go through an actual scenario on how we will actually execute. So to start, the Cyber Test and Training PM is working with ATEC to reduce risk for developmental and operational test community by providing a multi-domain, live virtual constructive environment. And we're gonna be doing this using our federated systems of systems solution. So the quote on the slide talks about how um, when you control the spectrum, you'll control the future fight, and that's key in what we're trying to accomplish. The Army's modernization new efforts are creating more complex systems with advanced sensors and interoperability requirements. This is requiring us to have to come with, up with new innovative ways for testing and training. Some of these future programs that we'll be supporting include long range precision fires, intelligence systems, future vertical lift, counter UAS and directed energy, hypersonics, and electronic warfare. So our three programs of record um, are used to create this future operating environment, starting with the Expeditionary Live Virtual and Constructive Command Center. This will be the overall command and control for the MDO environment. It's deployed with deployed with simulations including IEW, EP, TPP, OneSAP, and EXIS. So XLCC performs the LVC force-on-force -force adjudication for real-time casualty effects, the RTCA, and interfaces with the Threat Battle Command Force, TBCF. 
So IEWTPT is drives the multi-intelligence and EW critical tasking that simulating validated EW threats for a synthetic electromagnetic environment, while TBCF provides the live threats with situational awareness for our OP4 commander integrating real-world ISR and EW threats. So the 3D depiction that we're about to go through here is going to show you how these three systems work together. So starting with IEWTPT, you'll see um, simulated intelligence, and this will be depicted by the green dots. XLCC pushes data bi-directional, providing real-time feedback for the scenario and the RTCA. And this is shown by the white dots as, as the exercise control. TBCF is the live threat data with EW effects, and this is shown by the red dots. You'll soon see some red arrows that show the threat intelligence. This threat intelligence data and live blue four sensors collect against the live and the virtual threats. This is shown by the blue dots. So the synchronization of LVC, ISR, and EW systems translates into this its scenario which informs this complex analysis for our future systems. As you see this data flowing across the systems, it's creating that future operating environment with test monitoring and control and that critical decision-driven data. So really these three systems together is, is giving us that ATEX contested, congested uh, environment that we need for our future systems. So that is how our programs work together. Let's go ahead and walk through a scenario. Um, we'll hand this back over. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Jim. And LBC will be how we test. There, there's not enough live kit out there to to populate the test centers that are out there. We have to do this in an LBC env environment. So to do that, everything requires a scenario, right? Whether it's testing or training, and that's what we'll do. So you're gonna see, uh, as we move forward, a series of quad charts as we move through a very simplistic scenario. So as this kicks off, I, I will set the stage for Troy when he comes back up here, and then he will walk you through the scenario uh, totally. This is going to build for just a minute. Another few seconds. We learned this lesson a long time ago with IEWTPT. In order to train Intel individual crew and collective tasks that were decoupled from the larger constructive sim exercise, right? We needed a tool to do that. So you're going to see in our scenario here, these are IEWTPT tools. So we have a scenario where the hostile forces are, are, are coming from the west. This is central Florida. We did this again, as I said, for ITSIC. U.S. forces then began RSONI, reception staging, onward movement and integration from the vicinity of uh, Port Canaveral, partnering with uh, their mission partners and joint forces to regain the territory from the hostile uh, movement from the west. We have simulated uh, UAS air there, uh, mission partner uh, forces in what we're calling AO Bear in the vicinity of the convention center. And we have our scouts, you see the blue scout icon there providing overwatch on the convention center. Again, more more blue UAS that can uh, provide FMV, full motion video uh, and surveillance uh, in, into AO Bear. Another, another scout uh, represented there just north of the airfield. And then there's an, and as it pans back into the scenario, you'll see again, the blue forces in the east with uh, high Mars artillery to be able to answer direct support calls for fire from those scouts on high value targets uh, identified in AO Bear. So I think with that, uh, Troy, come on up and he will he will lead you and guide you through the, what each system will show in this simplistic scenario. Good morning, everybody. 
Um, so yeah, we're gonna walk through an actual scenario. XLCC is in the top left, TBCF, which is the op fours in the top right, and IWTD is in the bottom left. So we'll start with the live blue systems that are on the bottom left that are depicted in IWTPT. That information is obviously passed up to XLCC to be the white cell. Um, you actually have a lot red systems that are picking up. The blue dots are showing up our live systems picking up live blue force communications. Uh, they're working on triangulation, communication, and making sure that they're actually locating where these systems need to be. That'll actually pass over to XLCC as well, where you can see the uh, information being picked up for the white cell. So the XLCC can show both blue and red um, as the global white cell here. Um, the XLCC is also collecting all the data for monitor control and, and future AAR enabling and, and that. Um, so now that you've identified, they've triangulated, they're moving towards an actual jammer event with the OP4 and TBCF. As you can see, TBCF is going through its modes and actually selecting waveform, power level, uh, the azimuth and direction of the jam, and the waveform that needs to happen and the frequency. Uh, it selects all these, it can do full remote control. All of this is actually going to be passed over once it's stated to XLCC. So your white cell can look at locations, information, entity state, uh, both blue and red. It gets the full picture going across the, uh, the, the connection here. And then once it connects and actually rotates to the correct azimuth, uh, you'll begin jamming and you'll note this on both the top two screens. Um, you can note that the, aura, uh, the, uh, the cone is showing up on TVCF with your propagation model. It showed up on XLCC for a little bit as it was showing its direction and everything. Note here, the virtual systems on IEWTPT, the virtual ISRs are picking up live transmissions. This actually completes the whole MDO and LVC environment. So we have a live system jamming from TVCF, XLCC is picking up all this data and doing the adjudication and allowing IWTPT to see live communications and pick it up virtually. So that actually has an effective jam and we can show all the data that's happening right now on the top left. And then this rolls into a actual event that we're gonna do now where the system is still jamming the IWTPT system will actually send out a live uh, uh, observance force, which will actually pick up a full motion video. So he's tasking this, and it's going to send out a, a system to pick up visual confirmation of the Red Force jamming event to try to go to a full task missile flyout and actually do detonation. So you can see it's actually showing full motion video. Um, XLCC is actually collecting some of the data and XLCC is initiating that targeting process. So what would happen is your blue force on the ground, the live systems, would call for fire. Your white cell would say, I approve this call for fire, virtually of course, and then it will target this. So you have a virtual HIMARS sending out a virtual missile and it's actually zoomed in with the uh, full motion video and you'll see a virtual detonation. What to note here though, is as soon as that happens, you'll see that TBCF has gotten the adjudication. So TBCF will kill the feed to the system. As you can see, it's done. The OP4 operator does not know why it happened. It doesn't know what happened. He just knows he's lost feed. It, it is virtually dead. He will no longer have control of this for training. This is something that has not happened. And this is, this is brand new to the, the LBC systems and the PTO STRI MDO team is, We've never had live and virtual be able to play in this uh, arena before. So um, everything here you can see has been updated and now the blue, the OP4 has to fight without that system. Um, so that, that concludes this video. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Don to close out and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more. Thank you. So again, this is a powerful, powerful uh, set of integration and this tool is gonna drive multi-intelligence intel, it's gonna drive test training, it's, it's, it's going to support home station sites, but, but mainly the test centers 
you know, EPG, IEWTD, and we're, and we're teaming with Fort Huachuca uh, in a series of experimentations. This was built off of what was called Vanguard 23 that we did last year. We're prepping for Vanguard 24 now, the final planning conference. I'm going in a couple weeks. So we will continue to mature this effort to be able to support multi-domain operational kit that's coming down uh, on ATEC schedule. So let's go to a little bit of Vanguard 24 concept. Troy, you want to talk a little bit about this? Sure. I was I was asked to, to kind of brief um, our concept on Vanguard. It's pretty blurry on this one, but the main point that we're trying to say is so we, we've proven out what we're what our goal is at the end of the MDO roadmap. And how we're getting there is we are incrementally testing and building and testing constantly. And we're using multiple events across multiple years and a test bed at Fort Huachuca. This first slide is the uh, Vanguard 24 concept. It'll happen in September of this year. And the main concept is they're proving out distributed testing. They'll be testing out at White Sands, Fort Cavazos, Playas, with the headquarters being at Fort Huachuca. Um, the uh, MDO team will have the full LVC suite you see on this banner and we've talked about here as well as numerous live threats and all of this will be integrated and we'll be able to participate in the larger event. Um, if anybody's out at Vanguard and, and uh, Fort Huachuca in September, feel free to contact any of us here and we can help you come out and get an actual hands-on experience. And lastly, the uh, test bed at Fort Huachuca is the enabler to this is we are bringing our prototype systems, we're bringing the prototype software, and we're doing re uh, regression testing on all the equipment out there, and we're making sure it's mature enough to meet the final deliverables at the end of each calendar year. So this, cap this um, test bed is actually gonna have stakeholders across Wachuca, IWTD, um, we also have EPG, we have ICOE, we have uh, distributed testing available here, um, and it's also OTC and ATEC are heavily involved as well. So there's a lot of stakeholders in this, and this is going to be a, a great asset that we can start using while we're out at Wachuca. So this will be kind of the premier facility for at least the PEO Stry MDO team um, that you can come and see anytime we're in Wachuca. We have, we'll have a permanent ground there. Um, and that concludes my portion. So, wow. Thank you very much. That. Uh, we are rounds complete for uh, MDO LV, in an LVC environment, so we'll open it up for questions. Do we have time for any of that? 10 more minutes, okay. And we'll be around all day. I know this is probably a little hard to see some of those small icons, but we're around the rest of the day. Okay, great. Thanks for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Warriors Corner. Our next presenter will start at 1130. The topic for this one is driving equipment and facility readiness in the United States Army Reserve. Presented by Major General Harder.
uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Warriors Corner. We'll go ahead and get started with our next presenter, Major General Harder. We'll talk about driving equipment and facility readiness in the United States Army Reserve. Hoorah! Hoorah! Is that loud enough? I heard everybody else was quiet earlier. Good to go? All right, hey, Bob Harder, Commanding General of your Army Reserve's 81st Readiness Division. I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges we're having in the Army Reserve. I'm hoping that some of these big brains here can help us solve that. Uh, but, of course, our number one challenge remains recruiting and retention. Right, so i got a real short video we'd like to play. We'll play the video, uh, and then we'll get on with the brief. I'll take about 15, 20 minutes, and hopefully we'll get some questions. So go ahead, whoever's rolling the video. Are we good? G6. G6. Hey, we can get out with a brief, that's okay. If we can pull it up at the end, okay? So that'd be good. Next slide. I've only got, I have the video and five slides. Five slides. So first let me orient you a little bit to how the Army Reserve does business. Right, so 28 commands kind of reporting up to the three star. 21 functional commands, that's where a lot of our deployable capacity resides. By the way, we are largely enabling capacity for the United States Army. And I see a bunch of battle buddies here getting ready, Steve. Awesome, Steve. Awesome socks. <laughs> um, but a lot of TS, a lot of sustainment formations, a lot of logistics formations, engineers, medical, um, unfortunately, a lot of lawyers in our formation, but very, very capable attorneys. So we provide a lot of that enabling capacity. That's in those 21 functional commands. Our geographic commands, of those seven geographic, there, there's really four um, that I'm gonna talk about today. And those are the readiness divisions. I command the 81st readiness division. The shaded areas on that map are our readiness division footprints. So with a readiness division in the United States Army Reserve, we're kind of like a combination of INCOM, um, and AMC. So I manage all the Army Reserve facilities, for example, in my footprint. And I also run some direct support maintenance operations in my footprint for those, for those units that can't, uh, can't take care of their equipment themselves. So I just kind of want to orient you to how we operate. You know, we're, uh, you see our forces there, 190,000 soldiers strong, probably closer to 180 right now, but we're getting after that. Uh, over 2,000 units across the globe, across the globe. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So this is my footprint. So this is the 81st Readiness Division. And as you can see here, in my footprint, I've only got about 2,000 soldiers wearing my Wildcat patch. Right, and by the way, I am not out of uniform with this Wildcat patch. Right, there is the 81st Infantry, uh, Infantry Division that stood up in 1917, Camp Jackson, South Carolina, it's where we still are today, Fort Jackson, deployed into World War I, and we were the first unit ever authorized to patch. So the 81st does not have, that's a story for another day, we have to share that, but we don't have a colored patch to wear on our AGS use. So I'm not out of uniform, but in my footprint, 250 facilities, I've got 110 Army Reserve centers. Um, I've got uh, about 50,000 Army Reserve soldiers operating in my footprint. Uh, most of those soldiers, you know, they deploy, they fight, they win, they return. Uh, and I'm responsible for maintaining uh, most of their equipment. So the way we do business, in my footprint, I've got eight equipment concentration sites. 
Those are a little bit like a mate, an, an Army National Guard mates. As you know, in the Army Reserve, with our dispersion, we only do battle assembly. Um, you know, most of these kids are only out there once a month for two or three days. So I've got 80% of their equipment in my eight equipment concentration sites. Places like Fort Liberty, Fort Knox, Fort Moore. Um, you see them marked on the map there with the, with the, cross, uh, the cross wrenches. Out of Fort Johnson, we're, we're, we're moving one from Fort Novacell down to Gainesville. We're moving one from Vicksburg up in a partnership uh, with uh, Mississippi National Guard to Camp Shelby. So I have 80% of the equipment for those 50,000 soldiers operating my AO in those equipment concentration sites. Now what I'm getting ready to show you is I'm just going to be transparent. I briefed this to General Pappas maybe five or six months ago as I'm trying to get my, my head around this beast. Right, and the challenges that we're having with uh, with equipment maintenance, what we're doing to get after it, and where maybe there's some big brains in this room that can help us out. I'm also the senior commander of Fort Buchanan, Puerto Rico. So for that army base down there, that's an army reserve installation. And as a first commander, I serve as the senior commander down there. Next slide, please. So I come on board as a first commander. Now I'm trying to get out and I'm trying to visit some of these maintenance sites that I have. Make sure I understand what the challenges are. And so these are, you know, just being transparent, here are some pictures of some of the challenges that I initially saw that we're dealing with. Not in the ferries. Everybody's working hard trying to get after what they need to get after. But the way my equipment concentration sites are manned, right, they're manned with Army Reserve civilians that are military technicians. So a military technician in the Army Reserve, in order to be that Army civilian, you must also have membership, as you must be a soldier in the United States Army Reserve. So every one of my mechanics in my equipment concentration sites is also a soldier in the Army Reserve. And so that soldier can get mobilized, and then I lose the mechanic. That soldier can get deployed and I lose the mechanic, right? Soldiers doing what soldiers do, serving, serving the nation. But that is a challenge. I'm also only funded about 50% of the requirement. Not whining, not complaining, just stating the fact. So what has started to happen in my equipment concentration sites, where I have over 60,000 pieces of equipment, is that my mechanics are focused almost exclusively on five meter targets. Hey, do I have a unit that's getting ready to deploy? Do I have a unit that's going to NTC? Do I have a formation that is on the contingency response force? It means you have to respond to something that might pop up. Do I have something in the C2 CRE enterprise, NBC, you know, decontamination operations in support of the homeland? That's what we've been focused on. And I was walking through one of these motor pools and I came upon a, some, a bunch of uh, petroleum transportation, uh, a petroleum transportation company, basically, worth of equipment in the motor pool. A bunch of tractors, a bunch of 5K tankers. Didn't look that much different from this, had some flat tires. I said, when is the last time this equipment was serviced? When is the last time we touched this? Sir, we probably haven't touched this in 11 months. See my mechanics. Right? Maybe we can get the unit on battle, their battle assembly to come to my ECS site if they're in proximity, but we haven't touched it. And I said, what are we doing? What are we doing? So I just came from the presentation, the CMF that we just did on precision sustainment. Michelle Donahue there, my battle buddy, commander of CASCOM. She was actually at a forum I was at last week. The, the reserve component has nine has 100 percent of bulk fuel line haul capacity for the united states army 100 percent is either in the guard or the army reserve 90 percent of it's in the army reserve those tankers are the bulk fuel capacity that i was looking at in the motor pool 60 tankers 60 tractors but they weren't on c2 cre they weren't going to ntc they weren't part of surf so they hadn't been touched just because I don't have the manpower to get after it. And one of the uniqueness with the G Army system, 
We got a battle buddy here, Brian Brown, with the big giant brain that works on G Army, used to work on G Army, is if equipment hasn't been serviced or even touched, it doesn't get deadlined. So in the in the system, that truck company looked like it was about 90% FMC. Now the G Army won't allow you to dispatch it. If you try to dispatch it, you got to TI it, you got to inspect it, then you find everything. So I'm like, what picture are we painting for our senior leaders? Harder is assuming risk that's not mine to assume. Not mine to assume. So on the right there, that 414 TC mode, again, transportation company, this was a unit that wasn't on any patch chart, and they got a notification that in six months they had to be in Poland. So we had to mass on target. And what do you think we found? Report 95%, closer is not 15%, like it was probably closer to 45%. It, I had to ship mechanics there, we're trying to get parts on here. We got it done, we got it done, but that is the slide I briefed to General Pappas, Force Com Commander. I said, sir, I got one out the door in six months, all hands on deck. If something goes south in a big way and you need 10, I think I'm assuming some risk for you, sir, if it's not mine to assume. So I got crystal clear guidance from General Pappas. There really is no other kind of guidance that comes from General Pappas. And it was to get at, hey, go ahead and start eating. I want you to TI all your stuff. I'm like, sure, that's going to be hard to do. But we went to one ECS, actually the one at Fort Nova Cell, and I pushed all my mechanics there, and we inspected every ounce of equipment. And we found, hey, most units are reporting 85, 90, probably closer to 55 probably closer to 55%. And this is worst case, some of these pictures I'm showing you. But, but that's the problem set. That's the problem set. Now we're helping ourselves, and I'll talk about that. We're trying to get after this ourselves, but we're trying to figure, and the resourcing is what it is. I tell my team, no one's gonna walk into our headquarters with bags of cash and start throwing it at us. We gotta figure this out, right? We gotta figure this out, we're soldiers. So kind of combined with this problem set, you can go to the next slide are my facilities, right? So I've got the equipment side, but we're also managing facilities in our footprint. Like I said, 259 Army Reserve facilities I have spread throughout the southeast of Puerto Rico. About 110 of those are Army Reserve Centers. Most of them are 40 to 50 years old. They're in the southeast with that weather, the humidity, the storms. HVACs and roofs are just killing me. Killing me. And we're trying to work, you know, recruiting, retention is a big thing. And I'm putting kids in some lousy places. And they've got 20% of their equipment. Right? A lot of them not close to a range. And what you see on that bar chart, you don't have to read the numbers, but I'll explain it to you. And Compo 1 has the exact same problem. My active component teammates, my time at AMC. By the way, I was at AMC. It's off to be back, back here in Huntsville. Anybody wants to talk more about this later? I'm very familiar with Yellowhammer. Very familiar with yellow ham or not uncomfortable in the presence of a fine lager. What was that General Dempsey's quote? But anyway, so we have the blue line is the, the blue bars are the requirement to sustain what we need to sustain those facilities. Orange bars are what we're getting. The, the fuchsia line, whatever color that is, is the backlog that continues to build. So I got about a $1.4 billion backlog just in my AO for facility maintenance. Probably four billion across the Army Reserve. I think uh, Compo One has closer to a hundred billion. Again, no one's going to walk into our headquarters and start throwing bags of money at us. So what can we do? How do we start to get after this? Next slide, please. A way. What I have told my team. Let me make sure I'm on time here. What I have told my team is there's no idea right now that is too radical. There's no idea that is too crazy. The Army needs what we have. The Army needs what we have. They are not going to be able to, Compo 1 is not going to reform, restructure. They're going to need our fuel tank. They're going to need all the capacities we bring to bear. So how do we get after this problem? This is A-Way. There's an operational training center up at Fort Drum. Uh, in partner with uh, 10th Mountain, Army Reserve. You go up there. 
a proposal we're looking at to tee up for my boss, Lieutenant General Daniels and General Pappas is do we need to get away from this Army Reserve model of having reserve centers in every town and, being, and, and just having this dispersed formation with 10% of their equipment, they can't touch 90% of it, can't go to ranges there. Maybe we need to start looking at these training complexes where we can build barracks, where we have ranges, where maybe instead of eight ECSs in my footprint, I've got three, but I've mashed all my mechanics there. There are locations where soldiers can come in, stay in barracks, draw weapons, drive, drive their equipment, get trained, use NVGs, whatever it is they need to do. And we get away from this thought process of having Army Reserve Centers in every small town in America. Maybe we partner with the Guard. Doesn't mean we don't have presence, right? An Army Reserve Center, we've got a couple in the fight up, 50 to 65 million to build. The money is just not there. I can't maintain what I got. So this, this is something that we're looking to propose. A couple other things that we're doing in the Army Reserve, obviously we have a lot of that mechanics and maintenance companies in our formation. So now we're starting to bring those maintenance companies, hey, you're not going, you're not going to go out to a, just a local field problem and dig fighting positions. You're going to come to one of my ECS sites. You're going to set up your talk, whatever you got. We'll help get you to the range. But you're going to start turning wrenches. It's what you're trained to do, and it's what we need you to do. So we're doing that actually in July uh, with two maintenance companies who are going to come to Fort Jackson, do their AT at Fort Jackson in one of my ECS locations. That'll be a test bed. That'll be a test bed. We have an engineer battalion that is going to kind of test this out. One of our concerns was Army Reserve soldiers won't travel that far. I think the statutory limit is 150 miles. We're supposed to assign them, dictate. They're not going to travel 400 miles, even if we pay for it. I'm like, I'm not sure. <laughs> if they get awesome training, I think they will. Especially if we're covering it and we can put them in barracks. We can have some virtual touch, touch points with them between battle assemblies. We can lease space in small town America to make sure we maintain contact. Again, we partner with our Army National Guard teammates. But this is one of the ways ahead we're looking at. Just to try to solve this problem. And my last slide. Unless we've got the video ready. So again, you've seen a lot of these thoughts from General George, our new chief. Um, one of the things, we're, we're working some policy on mil techs. I told you about my mili military technicians, the criteria for employment as a mil tech is you have to be an Army Reserve soldier. What we have in policy, and it's insane, is that once that soldier hits 20 years of service and can retire, you know, from the Army Reserve, even though they don't, may not draw the retirement check till age 60, they lose their employment. And so some of them stay longer than 20, but some of them retire. And then I'm losing my most experienced mechanic. It's like the shop foremans are all leaving. And so we, we're working with the guard to maybe come up with, hey, can I have a Miltech emeritus policy where that, that, that soldier can stay in the Army, maybe muster once a year, maintains their Miltech status, we, we have waivers if you've been combat wounded in theater and you were a Miltech, you, you get to stay a Miltech, even if you're no longer a member of the Army Reserve because you get medically boarded out for being combat wounded. So there's a pathway there. Um, that's one thing we're looking at. I've had some other folks ask me, one of the things General Pappas brought up was, hey, should we just take all your reserve equipment and put in like APS CONUS or the old Pomkiss sites? Be a big target, we probably still need to train on some of that, but there's some of that, that thought process. A lot of our stuff isn't modernized, so that's a challenge. Um, and then the last point I'll make on this slide, some of my teammates have said, hey, shouldn't we push some equipment forward, Army Reserve, into those theaters where we might most likely be deployed so we don't have to get it there? The challenge from an Army Reserve perspective, very few of our formations are regionally aligned. We're globally available. Again, 100% of the petroleum transportation capacity for the United States Army is in the reserve component. Is in the reserve component. So we're working again, not whining, hoping to get some good questions, some big brains, come up and engage. Um, 
we're starting to get after this up ourselves, but, but we're trying to think of a different way to do business to deliver what is required by the nation, which is to have these young men and women and their formations and their equipment ready to go. Because if something happens, Army Reserve soldiers are going. The Army has made that decision with force structure. So that's all I got. Unless my video works, G6. All right, I started with recruiting retention. Uh, just show this real quick, a young, uh, young Army Reserve soldier, if we can get this to work. Okay, I got my aide here, my PAO right uh, with me. Um, happy to take notes, but does e anybody have any comments and or questions for me? Sir. Obviously you have a robust system for taking care of your vehicles. What are you doing for your maintenance as far as those photos and how you're upgrading those? So. Yeah, so we've partnered with uh, most of those, most of my ECS concentration sites are an active component installations, which works great. So we've partnered with the garrison teams. Um, we've started some of that stuff's excess. We've turned that in. Uh, Compo 1 garrison, like with Fort Knox, has been fantastic. And Fort Moore, we've cleared out a lot of space. So I've given the mission to my team, my engineer team and my G4 team, that we, we just got to solve that. And so we're getting after that internally with some contracting actions and then trying to use some internal assets to get after them. General, how are you addressing obsolescence? Uh, it looks like you address the manpower piece, consolidate people uh, for a higher throughput, but with that, you have obsolete equipment, you don't have the defense industrial base to support it. How are, what is the message you're taking to industry for parts and supply? Well, we work, thanks for that question, we, you know, get almost all of our equipment, 99% of it, flows down through Compo 1, uh, through standard procurement processes. We, we are now the chief, uh, and everybody sees, and it's happening especially on the guard side, right, where, hey, you got to modernize Compos 2 and 3 just like you modernize Compo 1, because we're all in this together. So there's some changes that are happening there. We have a, uh, both us and the guard have a, access to Negria, the National Guard Reserve Equipment Program. And so we do have a separate, I think this last year was 155 million, to go out and work our own procurement. And it can be on class seven type stuff, it can be on radios and, and technologies to kind of help us, but it just barely scratches the itch when you start looking at, you know, the 915 tractors we have, they're two generations behind. And so we've articulated that risk. They still work. They may work better than some of the new stuff. I think I think half of my stuff would survive an EMP. I'm not sure there's any electronics in it. We might be the last last compo standard. Um, but but we are partnered with uh, with our teammates in Compo One. Anybody else have any questions or comments? All right. I appreciate it. I'll be around if everybody wants to come up uh, and, and uh, ask me a question, make a comment off the record. Thank you.
Technology is changing the character of war. The lessons we are learning in Ukraine are not unique to Europe. Preparing to win, the next war begins today. Everybody. Uh, my name is Major General Ronald Reagan, and I'm up here with my Command Sergeant Major Kofi Primus. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit the way we see things in Europe that's really informing how we do sustainment globally. And I would start off with a bottom line statement is that um, Ukraine must win. And we must be prepared for global conflict and to be able to sustain it, sustain it at scale globally. We must, I, and I'll start off with a quote by um, President Ronald Reagan. I like that name, by the way. Um, and he said that we maintain our peace, we maintain peace through strength. And I really firmly believe that. And one of the greatest strengths that we have is our defensive allies, alliances. And as you know, in Europe, we currently went, NATO just added a 32nd nation. Um, and it's it really is a source of strength. And it's one of the biggest deterrents to an aggressive Russia and China. Russia's theory of victory in Europe is number one, to achieve tactical success, contest reinforcement, and to exploit time to buy get time to exploit um, time to gain strategic concessions. And the only way we prevent that is through rapid and assured power projection. And it, it has always been one of the core requirements of the United States military. Fortunately, we live between shores in which we have protection between two oceans, and we've always had to deploy over there to come to the defense of others. And I guarantee you that um, the enemy in the future will try to prevent us from doing that. One of General Cavoli's um, has noted that a free and prosperous Europe is dependent on the NATO security environment. And one of that is our ability to maintain that is by maintaining strategic mobility and to be able to power project. Now, as you heard today throughout the conference, logistics is hard and we will be contested. We will be contested in every domain. And so we must solve the problem of contested logistics. And I would argue that, you know, we've always been contested logistically, right? If you think through the Atlantic wall of World War II that went from the southern tip of France up, up, up to the northern part of Norway. It was contested logistics. I would argue the U-boat campaign in the Atlantic was also contested logistics. And if you think about it in the 1980s and 1990s in Europe, that where I started out as a young lieutenant, we had robust infrastructure. We had rail cars. We had data-informed you know, war plans, and we exercise those war plans through the defenders, through the through the reforger series of exercises. And I would argue that we need to continue to make those type of investments. And while we were fighting in the Middle East, China was investing and Russia was investing in new technologies, anti-access, anti-denial, anti-ship capabilities, right, drones, hypersonics and their ability to contest our ability to deploy over there. 
our, in the future, our adversaries will continue to, uh, to um, try to interdict our ability to power project. Russia miscalculated its, in its actions against Ukraine. But one thing it has enabled us to do, it has enabled us to see their intent. It has enabled us to be able to see our future clearly. On the hunt or be hunted battlefields in Ukraine, it's drones, it's hypersonics, it's new technologies. General Milley said that in the future war, the site that will adapt the fastest most likely will be the site that will be successful. I'll transition now to what we see. So if I, I ask myself constantly, if this was a 1939 moment, are we doing the right things to prepare for war? Are we doing the right things to set the theater? And I, I, as I look at it, um, as far as a sure and deter, we're, devo we're deploying over a division plus worth of capabilities all across the, all across the European theater in 2024. We're, we're utilizing multiple ports, multiple entries of access. We're supporting Ukraine. We're providing them with material support. We're helping them with training. We help, we're helping them to maintain their systems. And this is in real time every day. We're also supporting the evacuation of you know, civilians back to the United States, which is also part of our wartime mission. And as the SecDef has said, we firmly support the Ukrainian people and we will be with them for the long haul. But what I'm trying to do in early Feb February of 2022, when that conflict first started, it was a con contingency. And what I'm working on really hard now is to get into a campaign mindset using interior, exterior lines, making sure that we have the right stocks in the right place so that we can do it indefinitely if necessary. And more importantly, if it transitioned to conflict, we're prepared for conflict in the European theater. If you remember back, um, Europe during the Cold War, there were two corps in Europe. There was over four divisions in Europe. There were two armored cavalry regiments. The last re reforger, I was a, a, a young lieutenant, and I remember, you know, I think it was 4th ID that flowed over and we received them, we moved them into position, and then we fought, we did large scale maneuvers. Right now, we're, we're, we're in the midst of one of the largest exercises in Europe with over 90,000 soldiers, sailors, and multi, multi, um, multinational individuals that are supporting our largest exercise in Defender. And it's pretty amazing to see that. But yet, while we were doing the Defender, the, while we're doing the Defender exercise, you know, our adversaries are watching us. They're thinking of ways of how they, they can contest us and stop our ability to, to do logistics in the battlefield. Transitioning real quick to priorities. So the SACUR priority, the number two priority for SACUR is to pro project power within the UCOM AOR. And we're doing that, as I mentioned earlier, by de deploying over a division's worth of capabilities in, tw in 2024. We're also supporting regeneration capabilities across the AOR. My boss's General Williams' number one priority for me is set the theater. That means receiving multiple divisions from multiple ports, converging assets at the right point to have the right strategic effects. It's the speed of relevancy. It means having the right supplies in the right place for the right effects across the AOR. It means building multinational capability, having the right cross service agreements in place to be able to reach the right strategic effects. So as we're continuing to transition from a contingency to, uh, to a campaign footing, our number two priority is supporting Ukraine. We do this every day, every night, and it, it consumes a lot of time, but it's having good strategic effects. My Sergeant Major is gonna talk a little bit more about how we do that. But before that, I go into that, I wanna talk about theater campaigning. So theater campaigning, we're starting from two known start points. The first start point when we start to look at theater campaigning is that we will be contested. The second start point 
is that it's going to require us to operate in a joint multinational environment. We don't do anything without our allies, and we have 32 of them, fortunately, in inside of um, in Europe. The other is we operate off the cycle that you see up here, and that cycle allows us to have the operational effects that we're trying to achieve, whether that's freedom of maneuver, maneuver freedom of action, power being able to power project, or be able to sustain endurance. We operate off of four different lines of effort. One of them we talked about is contested power projection. It's the ability to rapidly project combat power from the continent of the United States into the theater and have decisive effects. We're looking at options such as being able to do our sum in contact, right? How do we fight our way through? Imagine a, the, one of the largest ports in Europe if that was interdicted. How do we still fight our way through that and be able to sustain and meet and do the operational effects that we're looking for? Are army pre-positioned stocks, are they in the right places? Are they in the right quantities, right? There's opportunity for us to open up army pre-positioned pre stocks in the high north, maybe in Norway. How do we do it south of the Carpathian Mountains? How do we have the right stocks along the central corridor? And are those stocks modernized? Do we have the right partnerships with industry in the right locations that if we did, if we transition to an Article 5 situation, we can ensure prolonged endurance. Adaptive sustainment networks. We work very closely in Europe with a lot of our, our multinational partners. And I don't care where the sustainment comes from. Imagine bulk fuel coming from a, a United Kingdom convoy. I don't care whether it comes from the Germans as long as it's in the, it's in the right quantity and it's in the right numbers and we can achieve the right effects. So how do we link in them, link in with them and pass data? Earlier today, Dr. Hill from AMC talked about AMC predictive analytics suites. How do we use data to inform decision making? How do we use data to be able to get the operational and strategic effects that we're looking for? Right, um, we're, we're integrating systems like APAS with great effects in support of Ukraine. It's being able to project, it's being able to see, and it's being able to make data informed decisions in real time that's having operational effects. We're using multimodal transportation networks in Europe. All means by air, ground, sea, barge, and to have great effects. For example, when the 82nd, 82nd Airborne Headquarters deployed, we received them at a, one of our nor northern ports, and then we were able to move them down the Rhine, Rhine River on a barge, and then we moved them through the Danube all the way into, into their position where they're at right now. But multimodal effects, it, it becomes very important as we go into the future. Secure prolonged endurance. Do we have the right stocks in the right place? There's opportunities for us in Europe to put things in places. I won't talk about the specifics, but not only enable us, but also our multinational partners. Do we have resilient autonomous distribution? There's opportunities for us to do production at the point of need. Inside of Ukraine, they're doing some great things with 3D, with 3D printing, additive manufacturing, right, to be able to achieve the operational effects that they need inside their country in real time. And then how do we do theater regeneration, right? I, I believe we're at the point now in the Ukraine conflict that has showed us that we can't assume that we're gonna pull equipment back from a theater and then move it back across the Atlantic Ocean for it to be regenerated. So how do we regenerate in theater? Do we have the right capability? Do we have the right skill sets? Do we have the right authorities to be able to do repairs on certain systems outside of the continental United States? And do we have the right tooling? Do we have the right linkages in industry? And is industry in the right places to be able to, to achieve real-time effects? And then the last thing that, that we're doing to campaign, 32 nations in NATO, we cannot do it alone. It takes all of our allied partners and it takes all of our allied capability to be able to achieve the decisive effect. We work very closely with all of our partners to include the Ukrainians, be able to use those operational effects. 
I'll now turn it over to my Command Sergeant Major to talk about lessons learned in your side of Ukraine. Yeah, good morning. Um, so, on the first two bullets there, as we look at our observations from, uh, from the last few years across Ukraine, um, when it comes to, to drones, we're noticing um, drones are being mass produced, AI enabled, and fully autonomous. They're low cost and are creating a lot of terror on both sides. Um, and it's destroying the very, uh, a lot of very expensive equipment and key nodes across the battlefield. If you're looking at no, uh, key nodes, there's a lot of discussions over this morning about being able to hide in plain sight and, and survivability. Uh, a lot of nuclear targets are being destroyed, looking at about a 24 hour span of how, how long a, a key node can stay up before it's, it's, uh, it's hit or targeted. And if they're able to fight in clusters in an expeditionary manner as well. From an aerial resupply and medevac, uh, uh, Tone. So we're looking at the golden hour that we're used to throughout the years may or may not be there at that point in need. Because of the use of drones are being used to targeted uh, ground chasm backs and low one uh, capabilities. So we just got to look at how do we get past the golden hour and su sustain life on the battlefield. Regeneration of combat power for is critical for large scale ground combat. What we're noticing is there's a lot of rapid uh, adaptation is changing the character of war. The war in Ukraine, what we notice is, is contested um, in the context of endurance and the, the side that can retain and regenerate and do production at, at a faster pace will, will be more advantageous on, on the battlefield. You kind of looking at it from a, from a training perspective, it all comes down to training and war fighting. And everything that we do, and everything that the, the, we're seeing that the Ukrainians do. The observations that we're seeing in Ukraine is not just specific to Europe, but it's a global trend when it comes to training and readiness as well. Soldiers need to be trained for contested logistics, be able to fight in, in small teams and dispersed teams. What we're seeing is available for them to hide in plain, in plain sight, non standard vehicles. Um, they, where we had a, a discussion with one of the Ukrainians what they mentioned to us is the ability for a convoy to get to the front line in case not looking at the convoy. So the ability to fight in our plane, plane site as well. Flat Kazi backs, I already talked about it when it comes to drones, being able to, to get past the use of drones, the targeting our ground Kazi back missions. And when it comes to the ability for um, to keep our sustainment, to keep our equipment in the fight. I think it's key for us to continue to leverage on tele-maintenance and what we learn from tele-maintenance to fix our equipment more forward in the fight versus bringing it back like General Reagan was mentioning. Um, I just want to circle back on one point. Uh, we had a discussion with one of the training logisticians and we asked him, hey, if there's one thing you can invest in over the five years that you know today, what would it be? And the three things that they mentioned was ammunition, production, and stockpile, maintenance capabilities, and parts, Hardening storage and, 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 and uh, hardening storage for the command post. The side that creates multiple dilemmas for our adversaries, sustaining massive operational effects at a critical point of time, and generating combat power will win in the fight with those. So, yeah. So I'll leave you with a short story of before we turn it over to questions and answers. I work very closely. Um, I work very closely every day with the Ukrainians and. Um, there's one, there's one Ukrainian by the name of Yuri. We developed a very close relationship. Yuri's family comes from a place called Mariupol, right? That was, no, it's no longer in Ukrainian hands, put it that way. He hasn't seen his mother-in-law since the conflict started, because she's on the other, other, other side. And his family had moved eight times since the conflict started. And, he, and, I, and I asked him, you know, Maury, what's your perception on this? And he goes, it's simple, we've got to win. Because at the end of the day, if we don't win, we, don't, sir, we won't exist anymore. Our language, our culture, our people, our history, our families won't exist. So I would ask, just remember Yuri. Thank you. Hey, sir, how are you? <laughs> well, you mentioned a campaign plan, a great idea. Back to the past, the user and reforcement both at the same time. What do you need from industry? What are you looking at from industry to assist you in that campaign plan? So we can start 
Yeah, so so I, I just came from a logistics campaign with the Ukrainians and then one from the perspective of us, the U the US. I think from the US perspective, industry's gotta be in the right place. I think there's opportunities to forward position, right, in the right places either in Eastern Europe or Western Europe. And I and I think we've gotta have relationships before the first bullet is ever fired. Right? At the end of the day, like Sergeant Major said, it's, you know, at some point, all, all wars become a stalemate, right? And a, and a stalemate is only broken by the ability to produce, right? And the site that outproduces the other is likely to be the victor in that, in that stalemate. And so we're kind of, I'm not saying a, a stalemate with respect to Ukraine, but it is a war of production, make no doubt. 155 rounds, you, you know, in open source, Russia's probably outproducing the West significantly. Right, um, and if we want to win that conflict, we got to start producing. Right, um, the the second part of that, I think, um, with respect, I'm not speaking for the Ukrainians, but they look for more capability inside of the country. Okay. Sir. Right, sir. Um, I see the, the comments you've got there. The in theater re regeneration of combat power. We hear that a lot from Indo PACOM. We hear that a lot from UCOM. How are we generating the requirement back to the people who would do that regeneration of combat power? How are we creating that demand symbol? Yeah, part part of it, part of it, it's a, and by the way, UCOM, I would I would give a shout out to um, PACOM and, and CENTCOM, we're in collaboration. So if you're hearing it multiple times, it's because we're talking to each other multiple times. At the end of the day, we've, we've just think about it. See, we really haven't had to regenerate combat power from severe losses in a large-scale conflict since maybe the Gulf War without bringing it back to the United States. So we really got to think through that. But to answer your question, the way we're giving that demand signal, number three, we're working through Army Material Command, um, take on back to Army Material Command to get the right through authorities for it, and then working with industry as well to be able to give them that demand signal. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Hey, sir, this is in regards to the uh, regeneration of combat power. So could you elaborate a little bit more as to what kind of options you're looking at for that? Well, number, number one is I'm looking for investment in some of our theater maintenance sites. And you know, be honest with you, I, I, I didn't know how important that was until I looked at what's going on inside of Ukraine. They have an amazing ability to innovate at the lowest levels. And matter of fact, we work side by side with them and we're actually learning from them on how to do ba battle damage and assessment and repair. You know, unfortunately, we haven't had huge strikes or mine strikes or, you know, anti-aircraft strikes or, or, or counter artillery strikes on some of our, our systems. So we're learning from them, number one. Number two, we're starting to invest in our capabilities back inside of the theater to be able to regenerate. Because remember, I said that logistics is gonna be contested. So if you make the assumption that you're gonna be able to free flow things across the Atlantic, I think that's not a good assumption. So how do I keep building that combat power inside of the theater? Investment in my theater infrastructure that's already there. Investment in new sites for, further forward in, in Poland. It's, it's, it's making sure that we have the right linkages to industry um, further in theater with reach back, back to the United States. And the last one, it's also, Sergeant Major brought this up, it's investing in new technologies like tele, tele maintenance and imagine using goggles that can see things forward without being there on secure, secure, secure means to be able to talk back and link into industry partners. We're gonna have to think about innovative ways to solve this hard problem. Right, and we're not going to be able to do it alone from a military, a DOD. It's going to take all of industry uh, to be able to solve those problems. Yeah, and sir, I would just add that I believe the, the telling maintenance is a feature of how we're going to do maintenance across the army. And that's a key lesson that we got from, from the Ukrainians and then from a lot of the infrastructure that we invested in in Europe and what we're trying to build there. I think we'll be able to do it. Um, you just got to just put the, the meat onto the bones really from the help from the industry as well. 
Yeah. How do we? How do you produce further forward? Right. Because it, you know, it's it's distribution. Logistics is a is, it's a math problem. It's time, space, it's physics. And then you 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 introduce an enemy along that supply chain. So the more you can do forward, I think the better that you'll be able to maintain momentum. Questions, one or two more questions, and then we'll close this out. Sir. Sure. How do we go about getting in touch with your group to discuss solutions to what you're describing? Yeah, so there's there's a couple of there's a couple of means. I know the Security Assistance Group Ukraine runs an industry day. Um, and they, they run it periodically. I want to say every six months was the last one that we had. There's also the ISOA conference that's being run um, in Kaiserslautern, another industry day forum that's hosted by um, some of our teams in Europe. And then there's going to be a land a landcom conference sponsored by AUSA. I want to say next summer. That's a good way to link into us. But but it, I would also say is it, we, I want you to take away from this the lessons learned in Europe is an opportunity for us to apply those lessons broadly. Because when we talk about contestant, it's whether you're fighting from the Indo-Pacific or, the, or, the, or, or Europe, it doesn't matter. And if you think back during World War II, remember it was, it was an axis of evil that we were fighting against. It, was, it, was, it started with you know, Germany, and then it, it, it transitioned over to Japan, and then it was Italy. And what you see is that when there's pushback against the norms, the international norms, it's not gonna just go in one theater or the other, right? So we've gotta be able to invest. There's always priorities and there's always dangers that would go over time, but we've gotta be able to think broadly. And so lessons learned from Europe apply directly to the Pacific and to CINCOM. And the enemy doesn't respect our geographical borders or our lines that we drew in the sand. It's a, it's a, bro a global solution. Any other questions? Go ahead. I'm curious, uh, as far as generating readiness, as far as generating readiness um, and being uh, operationally readily, can you speak to how you're, you know, the psyche of the of the soldier and what you're doing to invest in the people? Yeah, great, great question. So we have a lot of units that's, that's coming into the into the theater to the RAF, or our tenant units as well. The, the big thing that we notice with our organizations, the units that's coming in and out of the theater, that we're leaving at a higher state of readiness because they are getting real world type operational, real world type trends. Reps and sets, constant reps and sets over and over and over. That includes our current units, our 66 trend, the 66 system on the grade, and all the um, the mission enablers that, that supports the DSC. So there's a lot of great training value and a lot of great opportunities to bring and test other things into the theater because we were getting the reps and sets when we were operations. So, and I, I would also, you know, commend the chief of staff of the or, our army for his priorities of fighting, of war, fighting, war fighting, and then being able to generate combat readiness. Those units that are coming over to Europe, they're ready, right? They're not only ready to train, but they're ready if we transition to Article 5 in conflict. There's no doubt that the U.S. with the rest of NATO would be ready to defend and deter our, our adversaries. So good for force comm units and the things that they're doing when they come over ready. And then when they get in theater, as Sergeant Major is alluding to, we, we try to keep them ready and then return them back at a higher state of readiness. Probably have Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us today for this bit of Warrior's Corner. We're going to talk to you a little bit about human-machine integrated formations. My name is Glenn Dean. I'm the Program Executive Officer for Ground Combat Systems. We're located in Detroit. I have the responsibility uh, with my team for the design, development, delivery, and fielding of all the Army's uh, ground combat platforms. So you typically think of Abrams, Bradley, Stryker, or XM-30, their replacements, but that also includes the robotic combat vehicle. I'm joined by my two great partners from the Army Futures Command. I'll let them introduce themselves. 
I'm Travis Thompson. I'm the deputy for the Solar Valley Cross Functional Team, but I'm also General Roan's deputy. And for those that don't know, General Roan's dual hat is both the infantry commandant and the director of the Solar Valley Cross Functional Team. So I'm kind of sitting here in, in sort of both spaces and helping out with MC did, but ultimately focused on two areas. One, a lot of the requirements and the efforts that are coming out of Fort Moore in the in the HMI IBCT space, and then the class two UAS and below, you know, partnered with the aviation folks, and then also kind of where I'll spend a little bit of my time discussing is the dot mil PF integration, which is more of that TRADOC function and some of the things that the Maneuver C did at Fort Moore focus on, so that we're trying to balance out kind of where we're at, but uh, really looking forward to the conversation. And good afternoon, everybody. Jeff Norman, the director of the Next Gen Combat Vehicles Cross-Functional Team up at Detroit Arsenal. Uh, part of Army Futures Command. And I'm going to start off the discussion uh, this afternoon uh, talking about human machine integrated formations for ABCT. And then I'll uh, pass it over to Travis who will talk about uh, with the topics he mentioned with a particular focus on HMI for IBCT. And then uh, General Dean will uh, bring it home and correct the record if either of us misspeak, uh, but certainly describe uh, the program activities uh, across the board. and a number of exciting uh, efforts that are underway. So first off, in uh, sort of a, you know, consistent with the chart that you see uh, on the screens, um, I want to talk about human machine integrated formations for our armored brigade combat teams. First and foremost, uh, our robotics efforts uh, in ABCTs aren't about introducing robots to, to those formations. It's about improving the Armored Brigade Combat Team is a formation, uh, and that will involve adding aerial uh, robots, small UASs, and uh, ground robotic vehicles. So the, the approach that uh, General Simmering uh, and uh, the, the team at Fort Moore have taken to uh, introducing those robotic and autonomous systems is to, to build a, a platoon, a robotic autonomous system platoon, a RAS platoon, uh, and you can see it depicted there, sort of in the shadows uh, of what the, the baseline formation looks like. So a RAS platoon in an armored brigade combat team consists of uh, four uh, small UASs, two that are the short range recon, two that are long range recon, uh, four robotic combat vehicles. You can see a couple of uh, artist renderings of what the base configuration and advanced configuration would look like for the robotic combat vehicles. And then two control vehicles, uh, currently depicted as uh, uh, armored multi-purpose vehicles, Ant Vs, that serve as control vehicles. Fourteen soldiers uh, in that platoon. Uh, so seven in each of the control vehicles. Two uh, for the Ant V. One who serves as the section leader, the robotic section leader, and then two soldiers to control each robot. One to drive the robot, uh, for lack of a better description and one to control the payloads. So that's the, the formation uh, in a nutshell, the RAS platoon in an armored brigade. Now, how many of those platoons uh, would be in an armored brigade is a subject of some experimentation that's going on right now. Uh, and um, looking forward to, to putting that, those questions through their paces. Um, but importantly, um, another aspect of the experimentation that's going on right now is really putting a finer point on the roles and functions of the, the RAS platoon and human machine integrated formations. So previously, of course, we talked about the three Ds for robotics, so the dull, the dirty, the dangerous. And we know that you didn't come to hear us talk about the three Ds, so we thought maybe if we talked about the eight Ds, you'd be a little more interested in this uh, session right after lunch. So what are the eight Ds that we're talking about? We well, can see them listed up there. So if you think of this, um, sort of geographically on the battlefield, I'm starting far out, or deep for lack of a better term, and then sort of coming in close. So um, out deep, what we're looking to do, of course, is to develop uh, and disrupt. So develop the situation by increasing our situational awareness, making first contact using aerial and ground robots with the enemy. So developing our understanding of the, the battlefield, and then certainly leveraging fires, leveraging other effects to uh, disrupt the enemy and throw them off their game uh, from the outset. 
detect and deceive. You know, not all of the payloads that might be on robotic combat vehicles uh, are kinetic, lethal payloads. And in fact, we're finding that some of the electronic warfare, electromagnetic warfare payloads are some of the most pay, uh, um, uh, effective on the battlefield. The ability to detect the enemy, the ability to deceive the enemy by emitting signatures that uh, reflect a different size or type of organization. So those two, detect and deceive, are particularly helpful uh, on the flanks uh, or a little further out. To deny and degrade, as we get closer to our forward line of troops, of our manned and crewed combat vehicles, the ability to deny the enemy maneuver options by using robotic combat vehicles, RAS platoons to block uh, avenues of approach, uh, to trick the enemy as they're trying to leverage those, uh, or to degrade their formations as they're coming in through direct and indirect fires um, is a particularly useful role for robotic combat vehicles. And then certainly to destroy uh, enemy capabilities to defeat their formations through direct and indirect fires uh, in the close fight. So those are the eight Ds, broadly speaking, that we're looking to, to leverage RAS platoons and human-machine integrated formations uh, to achieve. So more than just the three Ds, I guess the three Ds maybe are the big overarching themes, but the, the eight Ds that uh, we really sort of fleshed out from experimentation are what you can see listed there. So high-level objectives. What are we trying uh, to achieve out of these human-machine integrated formations within the Armored Brigade combat teams? I'm not going to give you the specific vehicle requirements or capability requirements for the robot, ground or air. Instead, I'm going to tell you what it is that, that we're seeking to achieve at the high level for these formations. Because this is about formation improvement, not just adding a new platoon uh, to the ABCT. So first off, we're trying to optimize the performance of the humans, of the soldiers in those formations. Doing that by having robotic systems and potentially autonomous systems doing things that robots and autonomous systems do best. Routine, repetitive, uh, enduring uh, type missions. There are certain tasks that uh, robotic systems are, are much better for that allow us to optimize human performance because they're not having to do that now. Uh, and really that is the, the crux of the human-machine integrated formation, figuring out which tasks are better accomplished by robots, which tasks are best accomplished by humans, and then optimizing the formation for that. Certainly we want to increase the lethality of, uh, of the formation, so ensuring that uh, our capabilities uh, are always with a view towards increasing lethality is uh, one of our principal objectives. Decreasing formation size and weight. We're not looking to just add capabilities, adding weight, adding vehicles to uh, the formation. Ultimately, the intent is to try to reduce the, the weight or the size of the Armored Brigade combat team as well. Uh, some of that may be achievable by uh, adding robotic uh, capabilities and decreasing the, the number or size of some of the crude systems, the manned platforms that are in the formations as well. We've got to increase uh, communications, improve communications, and decrease the demands on the network. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a second when I talk about some of our challenges. Um, and as we add these formations, add these capabilities, decreasing the sustainment burden, or certainly not adding a sustainment burden that we haven't addressed uh, with our teammates from uh, uh, CASCOM and Sustainment CD. So an eye towards uh, sustainment is absolutely essential. And then uh, just like we seek to increase the lethality of the formation, increasing the protection of the formation uh, is something that seems uh, very achievable uh, as we add robotic capabilities, RAS platoons, really in many respects are optimized for enhanced uh, protection of formation. But all of these uh, objectives are, are not without their challenges. As we've seen through experimentation, both uh, in the dirt, out at the combat training centers, uh, at force con locations like Fort Cavazos and other places, and then certainly in simulation as well. So the first challenge is autonomy. Uh, and certainly autonomy is advancing uh, at, a, at a rapid clip. So if you're in the autonomy business and you're uh, moving the, the, the ball forward, uh, thank you for what you're doing. Uh, keep up the great work and, uh, and stay at it because autonomy is absolutely essential to realizing the, the promise of uh, robotic and autonomous systems. But frankly, autonomy isn't where we need it right now uh, for those robotic systems to operate without human intervention or human control. Which brings us to the second challenge, and that is communications aids. So given that autonomy is where it is, we're gonna need to have tele 
uh, teleoperation or control by humans for certain functions in the robots. So we need to have a, a communications link uh, that is uh, has sufficient strength and reliability and sufficient bandwidth for the data that's going between the robot and the control vehicle and vice versa. The challenge to that, uh, not only a bandwidth challenge, but also a range challenge. It's uh, not helpful if the robot can only be 500 meters from the control vehicle. You need to have tactically relevant distance. And we're talking four, eight kilometers, one or two terrain features, which certainly is a, a significant challenge, but one that I know uh, we're all up to the task uh, to solve together. Uh, and then lastly, um, you know, I mentioned some of the mission roles and functions that we're seeking to uh, leverage robotic systems for. Um, and you might say, well, one robot can't do all those things. And we absolutely agree that that's true. So in many cases, modular mission payloads that can be swapped uh, out for certain missions uh, are gonna be essential to the, the efficacy of uh, these RAS platoons. But those modular mission payloads and the robots that they ride on have to be rugged and reliable. And those uh, systems that are forward on a robot have to be capable of operating absent human intervention. You know, if a machine gun jams, there need to be solenoids and other actions on there that can be done remotely. Um, a 50 round ammo box is probably insufficient for a robot that's operating for 18 hours eight kilometers in front of the forward line of troops. It probably needs a four or 600 round ammo box so the crew doesn't have to go out to the robot to reload uh, the 50 cal. Those are the types of things uh, that we have to think through. That robot truly does need to be forward uh, and capable of operating without a human uh, intervening. And uh, we're looking forward to continuing to work with industry to define those requirements and see what technical solutions are uh, developed for them. So, we're excited about the, uh, the promise of human-machine integrated formations uh, for the ABCTs. A lot of awesome experimentation going on now and in the future. And for all of our industry partners out there, thank you for the work you're doing in this space. And we look forward to working together to continue to move the ball forward. So thanks. With that, I'll pass it over to Travis. Thank you, sir. Um, as I said earlier, my name is Travis Thompson. I'm the deputy on the solo thought across functional team. But I'm going to mix my comments are not just coming from a CFT perspective, but the larger requirements uh, represented by MC did and others, um, and then also kind of from the TRADOC side and some of the dot mil PF space. Because we're talking about, and I'm going to start a little bit with the with the dot mil PF. So as we, we talk about the the technologies that we're doing, and, and General Norman did a great job of, of bringing up some of the challenges and the capabilities that we're trying to deliver in. But remember that you know, when we do the, the holistic dot mil PF look at it. If we're fighting exactly the same way, but just with a robot, that's probably not going to be the most effective way to, to achieve the full capability that these systems can provide. But we also have to realize that the formations themselves then have to do things differently. And that requires us to start to do that larger dot mil PF, the, lar the longer term experimentation so that we can change how we do the training, how we do different aspects of everything we do, how qualification looks. How do you generate the thought process for leaders with increased situational awareness coming in that is absolutely critical that was described? So that isn't going to happen in you know in three week intervals that happen four times a year. That that that's it. We're going to get bits and pieces, but we're not going to learn what we learn on week four, right? So the dot mil PF is important. Otherwise, what we're going to see is we're going to start demanding from a dot mil PF perspective that we can't make trades in all the areas that aren't the M and then expect the M's to solve all those other problems. And that, that drives up cost, that drives up development time, that drives up um, risk. And what we have to say is that when we're doing this as a, I'll say, trades across the dot .mil PF, that's gonna have to happen. So the experimentation you're seeing and that, that, was, described by General, that was described by General Norman is critical. Now. Because if we're not learning those lessons, then we're just gonna keep doing the same things and we're gonna ask how it does something different. So I just put that in context. Right. The, the other one is, is that we've got to start trading at the IBCT level. So at the HMI IBCT level, we're really talking about, you know, trading steel for lives, for soldiers' lives, right? Remember that 90% of the casualties since World War II have come from the infantry, right? 76% of the casualties in Iraq and Afghanistan came from five MOSs. 
right? It's a close combat force that is routinely dying, and we want other things to do that. So you do that by over the over the horizon, the online of sight, situational awareness, increased capability, increased lethality, greater range and duration over which you can fight, but ultimately trading steel for lives. That's what it's all about, right? It's not just, you know, yes, you have to fight together, but we're trying to figure out how you do that more efficiently and more effectively, presenting more dilemmas to the enemy because you have more precise information to help you in your maneuver, which then allows you to present different challenges and different problems to your adversaries. And that's not specific to a key piece of technology or to a specific program of record, but it is what's important for the formation, which is what we're describing. So whether that formation be 14 in the ABCT or the 18 in the IBCT, and those are just things that people are looking at when we're finding that, it's what capabilities are likely going to change and what we do is going to change, so just keep that in mind. But ultimately, we're trying to increase the situational understanding, lethality, protection, all the same things that General Norman talked about. That's not different between the A and ABCT and IBCT, but the level of protection or the distance over which you have to do, those are different. But some of the solutions in the space between the HMI, IBCT, and the ABCT may very much be the same. An SRR, or short-range recon, or medium-range recon, they may be exactly the same, but the payloads may be different. So those are ways that we have to think about modular mission payloads and how we tailor this. And while it's specific to the formation and we're trying to deliver that formation and how we do formation.mlpf, that doesn't always mean that it's unique to only that formation. Right, so, um, so I throw that. And the key to success is early integration, as I described. That experimentation, the early integration, doing things at Fort Moore so that we're having enterprise level learning that is changing how we're doing everything. We don't have to have the right robot or the right UAB to teach leaders how to plan for UAVs that are going to be used against you and how you're going to use those UAVs or ground systems to generate an advantage on the battlefield. We just have to have surrogates. We have to have ways that leaders can start to see that. So I just throw that out there as a different way to look at this, and that's also about integrating the new technologies. Um, and, and that if we don't learn that way, we're just going to be learning the same lessons over and over again. And so it, it makes it challenging. With that, I'll turn it over to General Bill. Thanks, Travis. Jeff, appreciate the, the setup. So what I'm going to talk about is what we're doing programmatically in PO ground combat systems, specifically in the robotic combat vehicle program, which really just supports the HMF, uh, HMIF armored formation. So that's the armored uh, solution that is the program of record uh, intended to deliver an enduring capability. Uh, there are three lines of effort, one of which has five elements to it. So I'm going to walk you through those elements of the program. Uh, so three lines of effort. The first is surrogate prototypes. Uh, these are things that we bought essentially off the shelf that we're using for experimentation that supports all the learning that Futures Command is doing, largely operated by our partners in, uh, in DEVCOM. Uh, we did a fairly robust experiment in 2021 with the 1st Cavalry Division. Very broad set of capabilities we explored there allowed us to neck down uh, requirements uh, quite a bit. So the next round of experimentation that occurred in the summer of 2023 with the Black Horse uh, through two rotations of the National Training Center really showed the ability of the force to iterate tactics, techniques, procedures, tell us kind of if, if the general requirements we had were right and how those were dialed in. We'll repeat that again later this year. And then from a program perspective, we're going to hand off the remaining surrogates uh, to some of our partners to continue experimentation because PMs are, really aren't experimenters. Where, where they go do when you got to deliver something, folks. So the other two lines of effort are really about the enduring capability. The second line of effort is our actual robotic combat vehicle platforms. That has five sub-elements to it. The first is a control vehicle. You have to control from someplace. The program doesn't buy the control vehicles. They're expecting the Army to deliver those. But it does have to integrate to those control vehicles. And to date, we've integrated against Bradley's uh, strikers, but the anticipated enduring solution is on an armored multi-purpose vehicle. Give us a little more space, give us adequate protection and something that's common to an armored brigade. The second element of the robotic uh, combat vehicle capability is the warrior machine interface. How do you control that system? That is something that has been in continuous development. It's really a DEVCOM GBSC led activity. Um, some great support from our partners uh, down here at uh, Redstone because the underlying software, there's a lot of commonality with the, what we're doing for air control. Um, and the reality you need to understand is these robotic vehicles are predominantly teleoperated systems. 
It's a human being who's watching through a sensor and who's physically controlling virtually every action that robot does. I'll talk about what, why that's important to understand here shortly. So that's the WMI gets uh, integrated into the control platform. Then the third element is actually the communication system that allows you to talk from the control vehicle to the robot. Um, we're getting some commercial off the shelf things, some work uh, out of the C5 ISR center and our C3T counterparts. Frankly, from where I sit, our biggest risk and challenge is in that communications link. And the issue is partly the amount of data we can transmit at a latency. And the other problem is the amount of spectrum we have to do that. Because what we've learned from our uh, soldiers operating our surrogate prototypes is they want, want very high fidelity and very low latency. We cannot drive a robotic combat vehicle more than about 25 miles an hour under teleoperation safely. There is too much latency in most communications. Okay, well, how do you handle that? Well, you end up with a really big data pipe. And if you have a really big data pipe, you end up needing a lot of spectrum to pass that data through. There is not enough spectrum allocated to military operations the way we do it today for us to operate any sort of reasonable density of robotic ground combat vehicles on the battlefield the way we currently do through teleoperation. So if there is an area that is critical and essential to growth, is how you handle your control and how you handle data latency and how you manage spectrum. And we're gonna have to give commanders the ability to dynamically manage spectrum because they may have to trade capa spectrum capability between air platforms and ground platforms if they have a relatively robotic dense formation. And the third element is the platform itself. And the platforms that uh, we're in development on, we have four contractors that are competing right now. Uh, we'll make a down select uh, late next year to a single that will eventually be the, the first iteration program of record. The intent is that will iterate probably every five years or so. We'll change out hardware. Um, but that's basically a platform deck that has a wheeled or a tracked automotive element that can be controlled remotely, drive by wire, shoot by wire, and then integrate the fifth element, which is really what matters, which is a robotic payload. Today, there are two elements to the payload that RCV is uh, delivering. It's really a remote weapon station and a tethered unmanned aircraft. So the vehicle can see, it can shoot to defend itself, and it can see over uh, intervening terrain, really to enable reconnaissance capability. So that's the, the program of record uh, element for the payload. Now the third line of effort in the program of, uh, of record is our software pathway. That's our method to grow out of teleoperated control. So we now have six contractors under contract, either doing software integration or developing individual autonomy capabilities. And so whether it's um, aided target detection or waypoint navigation or something else we can automate on the platform that then does not require regular intervention by the robot operator and that's how we solve our way out of the spectrum and bandwidth problem if our experts in the communication field can't come up with a clever way to do it so we can maintain teleoperation. And that's ultimately how we get from our current density of two soldiers operating one robot to one soldier operating one robot to one soldier operating two, then four, then eight, is we have to have the autonomous capabilities. You see it already in unmanned aircraft, right? You can see swarms operated by a very small number. Yeah, those swarms don't have to maneuver on the ground, uh, which frankly is a very hard problem. And the, even our commercial uh, autonomy industry really doesn't have the military relevant data sets to enable the development of autonomous algorithms that will matter for us when we need to maneuver off-road. So that's the other significant challenge in our autonomy space. So three lines of effort, five elements under the platform line of effort that software and communications really are Achilles heel for the future. A lot of work being done by our DevCom partners in the next iterations of payloads, those are really gonna make the difference in this capability. At the end of the day, we're delivering a robotic truck that can do many things. You probably don't wanna do all of those things, but what things you want it to do at any point in the battlefield, in your particular operation, those may change from mission to mission, an operation operation and having the ability to modularly change those payloads should give the commander tremendous flexibility and we've seen that demonstrated already in the experimentation at the national training center this year where um, 
not with our prompting, the black hole sol soldiers took a few capabilities that they had for other things, like smoke generation, like electronic warfare, put those on the robot, used the robot to deliver that to a point in the battlefield where it was able to have an immediate tactical effect. It was not something we envisioned when we started the experiment, but was something that they demonstrated the ability to rapidly integrate and operate in, on the moon. So that's uh, what's happening in the RCV program space. And with that, I think we'll take your questions. So raise a hand. Uh, Aaron's coming around with the microphone. Um, so I understand the, the Rasper change, the number, how many, is still up for debate, but are you saying it's a, a done deal that there will be Rasper teams at some point in brigade combat teams in the future? Thank you. So I'll talk on the ABCT side, and this is really, uh, I'm, I'm channeling, uh, general simmering uh, the, the armor commandant. Uh, so is it a done deal? No, uh, because that's uh, only affected through the total army analysis, the TAA process. Uh, but they are in the process of drafting the force design updates, the FDUs, that include uh, RAS platoons, uh, and those will be submitted uh, up to uh, the Combined Arms Center at uh, Fort Leavenworth for consideration, and then if approved by the Combined Arms Center, up to the building for uh, Army G357 uh, to integrate through the TAA. So we won't see those designs uh, in the R-Struck that was just published, uh, but those force design updates are working their way through the system now. Uh, the, the armor uh, commandant has developed those and uh, we're doing experimentation with those RAS platoons as he designed uh, right now. Thank you. 
So, and I, I don't think this is specific to the A, the B, C, D, or the I, B, C, D, but part of it is the supply and so part of it is the demand. So the, the other area, so autonomy is going to level, you know, there are functions that don't necessarily, as, as General Dean was saying, that we can't push that pipe to the level of a top, that, you know, if we're trying to tell a, you know, remote, those capabilities, that requires a, a larger bandwidth. But if more of those capabilities become organic to the system because they're, they're autonomous and they can just do that, some of those functions, that reduces it. Soldiers, early integration, as I described, are also going to learn where and when they need it and when they don't need it. And so therefore that's going to reduce your, your, your actual you know, your requirement for the total amount of data. So we're going to have to figure out, the only way it's going to work is if we attack it from every single angle. We're not going to get one breakthrough that's going to be the be all end all. We're going to have to attack it just like we do tactical power and load. We have to attack it from every single angle and collectively you might get a 20% or a 30% improvement, but it looks like 7% in four different areas as opposed to 30% in one area. So um, it, it's going to take the, the larger group to do it, and it's going to probably be a bigger dot mil per net thing and, and not just a, a material thing. Yeah, we continue experimentation. This is really all about iterative dot mil PFP integration. We're not going to get the policy questions right the first time. We're certainly not going to get the doctrine and the training right the first time. You have to be able to iterate. Um, and with regard to managing data, a lot of this get, comes down to what do you want the systems to do. We have taken on probably the most challenging data spectrum management problem because we picked the tactical application that requires the most user intervention, requires the lowest latency and the highest fidelity data. If I had a robot, that all I needed to do is drive to a point on the battlefield and turn on and turn off. It's a smoke generator. It goes to a, a grid coordinate and it turns smoke on and then turns smoke off. I can run 50 of those in the same amount of spectrum that it takes me to one, one reconnaissance. Depends on what capability you want. Any other questions? All right, well, I think we're at the, uh, the end of this session anyway, so the timing is perfect, so. Um, as uh, General Dean alluded at the, the outset, and we'll give him the final word, um, I just want to thank everybody um, who is a teammate on this journey. So, uh, you know, we've got folks from Detroit Arsenal reflected up here, both from the PEO and the cross-functional team. We've got Fort Moore, uh, and Travis is, uh, is carrying the, the, the flag for all of the Fort Moore teammates. But there are many other folks that are involved in this journey as well. So, Rob Monto and, and Rick Doe. Uh, is an active partner in the human machine integrated formation uh, work that's going on. Uh, there are numerous uh, labs and centers that are part of this as well. So it takes a village. And we appreciate uh, not only the folks on the government side, but also everybody who's here from industry who's working to solve this problem. So thanks for your attention today. Uh, I'm going to pass it to Travis, but I uh, really appreciate uh, you being, being willing to go along with us on this journey. Thank you. I was going to say that you guys let me know and I didn't ask any questions. So, uh, generally, for the next year, it's clear we're going to ask more questions for the next group because that's not us. That's all. But, but, but really appreciate it and, and uh, really echo everything that Joe wanted to say. Thanks. Uh, thanks, thanks uh, for your attendance and thanks for my great partners for uh, this continued participation on this great journey we're on. Have a great day.
folks here locally, I hear this is the best rows, the two and three best rows in the house, uh, right up here in the front row. Hey, it's great to see everybody here in Huntsville today here at the Vaughn Bronx Center. Super happy to be here with y'all. Um, glad everybody made it in with the weather tonight. I know it was just, uh, last night, it was a little bumpy coming in on our flight over from Atlanta. I know coming in from Texas this morning might be a little bit bumpy too, but hey, glad everybody's here. Really appreciate y'all being here and, and wanting to know more about the direction we're headed with some of our new programs and, and really some of our cutting edge programs. I'll get to a little bit of detail here in a moment, but we're, we're going to have a nice little video here for you to kind of show you a vision of the future. Uh, unfortunately, it's not uh, coming up, but if we get it up here at the end, we'll, we'll play it for y'all. It shows kind of a vision of how things are going to work. Y'all have probably seen uh, launch effects and, and our uh, Enduring Fleet aircraft out there together already in some of the videos, but this video is really just going to depict some of that vision of how we're going to fight in the future. Um, so really quick, this introduction, it's great to be here with my battle buddy, uh, John Kane Baker from the FBL CFT, and my teammate, my Colonel Daniel Medallia from the PMP UAS. Uh, we've got a few things to share with you here today and hopefully have a good discussion. Um, we welcome your uh, questions here at the end. So if you have anything that spurs some good thought as we're going through our discussion, please do let us know. Uh, just by way of quick introduction, uh, I've been here at the PEO for aviation now for about 60 days, and I think you all have probably heard that uh, there's been a few uh, updates to our priorities and our budget for FY25. Uh, I'm not going to talk in detail about all of that today. It will take up the entire time, so that's not my intent. What I will tell you, though, is that I want to share just a couple things about how we're doing things differently up front, and then I'll turn it over to General Baker. Um, but overall, in the PEO, and you've probably heard uh, Mr. Camarillo speak about this this morning, we've heard a lot of Army senior leaders speak about how we're doing things differently. And so I would start start with, first of all, we're using appropriate authorities and appropriate contract vehicles to get after the speed and acquisition. So that's number one. We're moving out at a pretty quick pace. And you'll see here in a moment all the different lines of effort we've done. And we've got going in one space, in the UAS space. Now, the second piece is that we're doubling down on our modular open systems approach. So when I say we're doubling down on it, you're going to see requirements for our modular open system architecture the standards and interfaces, and all of our upcoming requests for proposals, and all of our upcoming requests for white papers, very similar to what you saw maybe a couple years ago when we were executing the floor of RFP. It's going to be very similar standards in these upcoming RFPs. So we're doubling down on MOSA. A couple things we're up, you know, kind of addressing in the strategic environment. One is the supply chain. We're going to address the supply chain risk management pretty heavily, and we're looking at cybersecurity heavily in our future integrations. Uh, but I'm not going to steal Danielle Stunder on all her programs, nor General Baker. So with that, I want to say we've got some great teamwork across Army Aviation and across the Army right now. So specific to our aviation programs and even our launch effects programs, we're working across multiple PEOs, including our Ground uh, Maneuver Center, our Aviation Maneuver Center, multiple Missiles of Space PEOs, this PEO for Soldier, PEO for IAWS, and we're working together to deliver the capability. But we couldn't start to deliver that capability if we didn't have a good, great set of requirements and a great relationship with our requirements owners. So, Kane, over to you. Thanks, David. And we're going to show Kane Baker. I'm the uh, future vertical FCFT director. I took over this past summer from uh, Wally Rugen. I came out of the Pacific. I spent two years over in the Pacific watching that uh, environment and understand the tyranny of distance and why uh, future vertical lift is so important. So uh, Global Force couldn't have come at a better time. I just spent the last 30 days out in California, a little bit in San Diego, uh, then up at the National Training Center. So I'm still cleaning a little bit of dirt out of my ears uh, from that. And uh, I'd like to talk about that um, as we go through this discussion. And, and then sandwiched between uh, PCC4, Global Force is our upcoming EDGE event. Uh, this is our experimentation that we do specifically uh, here on the FVL and I'll talk a, you know, a, a broad portion of that. I'll uh, comment on you know, David's comment on our requirements. And I will tell you, you know, with this panel, launched effects and UASs, it touches more equities in the Army right now in the Joint Force than I would say any other program. Uh, we started uh, this past year updating a couple of requirement documents, uh, mainly our launched effects. That launched effects has allowed us to have a discussion across a very, very wide array of, uh, of, of different individuals from all the centers of excellence, from maneuver to intel to cyber, uh, to our CDIS, our capabilities development offices, and then as David mentioned, our PEOs. 
And for us to get to a true capability on launch defects, it's going to take a broad and big effort. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of dive into that here in a minute when we talk about the role of, of launch defects and then our UASs. Uh, but very, very busy time right now. As David said, uh, this partnership uh, continues to grow and it's gonna have to grow uh, if we're gonna meet the emerging threats here in the next you know, 10 to 15 years with these capabilities. Because it's all about standoff and it's all about putting that machine out front to allow that initial absorb uh, to you know, make that initial contact with the enemy so then we can do the nation's bidding uh, with those in uniform. So I'll hold off here before we get to the slide and uh, I'll hand it off to Danielle if you got any opening comments. Yeah, thanks, sir. So what you're gonna hear is not only launch defects, but UAS holistically is truly a revolutionary capability. How do we extend that operational reach, keep the soldiers out of harm's way? Um, and it was even codified in doctrine this past fall that we will, we will lead with uh, sensors and robots before we uh, trade blood from our soldiers. And, and that's what we're here for today from uh, transferring that risk onto a, a machine. Um, we'll talk a little bit about launch effects and then broadly the UAS portfolio. Back to um, General Baker's point. We are receiving requirements from the FBLC of T, the aviation seated, the sustainment seated, uh, the cyber uh, center of excellence. So we have a tremendous amount of teammates in the requirements community and as also with the other PEOs. Uh, specifically, we work tremendously uh, hand in hand with PEO IAWNS because at the end of the day, a lot of these UASs are nothing more than trucks with awesome sensors and awesome capabilities and payloads on it. Um, and then, of course, uh, our teammates in Camp Tagum who fall under uh, missiles in space uh, because they are the experts when it comes to lethality. And I think you're going to see in our requirements document, as a matter of fact, I know, um, kinetic capability will be on all of our UASs as we move forward into the future. So that's also a tremendous uh, change as well. So back to you, sir. Thanks, Danielle. So what does launched effects look like? Um, as I came into this job, I started asking the question, hey, if I'm at a brigade or a division or a corps, what does this really mean for me? And so, you know, launched effects have got to be able to do three things. One, it's got to be able to conduct that reconnaissance and sissy mission at Echelon with core division and brigades, if we've uh, defined it. It's got to be able to be able to penetrate into these uh, IAS, into these um, uh, systems that you know at range and then we've got to be able to do it with the joint force so now you operationalize that you go okay what are the ranges what are the altitudes we want to look at well we've seen um, survivability we know where we can operate uh, we know where we want our launch effects to fly in this lower tier air domain and we know the payloads that we want to to, to put on them to be able to do lethal and non-lethal capability and then the, the question is, how do you integrate it into a formation with something they haven't had? And we're talking ranges beyond 30 to 40 kilometers and beyond. So how do we integrate that capability? And that's where I work closely with David and Danielle. Uh, a lot of things that we say are attributes uh, above and beyond just specific payloads. We, needed them, we need them to be attributable. We need to be able to give the commander a class five, an ammo type capability and say, hey, here you go, one time launch, use it. But it's gotta be affordable. Um, it can't be the two to $300 million um, one time shot, uh, cause we're gonna need mass type of capability. It's critical that these attributes look at behaviors. That's the secret sauce behind all this. How do we put these attributable systems together? How do they work in advanced teaming and how do they extend the range of the commander? And then finally, uh, we've got to have the ability to pass that data quickly back. And I'll, uh, I'll, dig, I'll go into a little bit more detail on what we did out of PCC4. But that sensor to shooter, that on the edge, uh, tactical edge of capability, to provide that sensor back in a very quickly, uh, timely manner to in order to provide that lethal effect to it is what it's all about. So it comes down to speed. And so, you know, as our requirements, as we've updated this year, um, really capability-based and walking across all the, uh, uh, the equities, we now see launch effects coming off of the air, which we always had, which a lot of you known as ALE, 
uh, air launch um, effects are now also ground launched effects and we've also pushed a uh, special piece in there for maritime so extend it specific payloads put it at echelon core division and brigades is where we're thinking um, have a network that supports it and be able to do it at the speed in order to make an uh, impact on the battlefield for the commander um, which then affects the enemy very quickly and gets inside their decision cycle. So Dave, I'll hold there and then uh, we'll jump into PCC and EDGE. So just a couple of additional points there about uh, the power of those demonstrations. And I can go back several years now to when we first started demonstrating things with, uh, with the CFT back in the 18, 19 time frame. Started seeing the capabilities that were maturing and started actually learning from them to inform our requirements documents. And so as as they inform requirements documents and then those requirements documents are translated into system performance specifications and then we can share those system performance specifications with industry and then get industry's feedback right and, and i'll use the, the MOSA example again right so we we had some mission system architecture demonstrations we had a lot of integrations that were done well back in the 2015 16 17 time frame that we leveraged and we built upon we brought forward to industry and then we asked for industry's feedback and we wanted industry's feedback, we took that feedback and we built it into our architecture frameworks. And I would say this space is no different, right? We have learned so much from how to build architecture from the component spec model all the way to the actual requirement itself. And, and the traceability in between and the speed that's going to enable us in the future for upgradability and really to stay ahead of the threat when we have new systems, new payloads. We want to bring those capabilities on. We want to acquire those capabilities faster. Just like we said, we heard some of the same we was talking about today. We want to have open systems architectures to acquire capabilities faster, to stay ahead of the threat, and to keep up with the pace of technologies. Technologies are changing quickly. These demonstrations show that. We're able to then react to that, take those into our system specs, and, and translate that to industry. And so when you're coming back on the industry side or from a lab and you're looking at these system performance specifications, know that they're informed by all of this demonstration work that's going on for the past five, six years. And it's been impactful about getting things across that valley of death, right? It's, it takes the two sides to pull across the valley of death. You can't just have the little Indiana Jones bridge and try to get across it by yourself. You have to have both sides working together. Just follow up with, um, with both these gentlemen stated. So historically, there might have not have been a great communication between labs and PMs. I can tell you the last two years that it's fundamentally shifted. We are working hand in hand, not only with the FLCFT when it comes to their PCC and the vanguards, but TDDA, the labs, whether they're in Warren, whether they're in Eustis, we are collaborating more than ever. Specifically, we, we have stand-up meetings every week. Hey, how, what are you doing? Where do you need help? And we are absolutely experimenting with our labs. We're transferring it much easier than we ever have before. And that is an enabler. It is a huge enabler to, to really move at the speed that technology is. Not only are we accelerating uh, the requirements perspective, but from a fielding perspective. And we're gonna show a quick schedule chart here in a bit that shows quickly, how quickly. It's amazing. When, uh, when you hear the AAC, AAE say you're moving too quick, and they did it in a very positive perspective. That was not negative, it was very positive. You know you're doing the right thing, and that's because of the, the teaming and that experimentation. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> so, transition a little bit to PCC4, what we learned out there, what we did, and then where we're going here in the fall with our FEL specific edge event. So if I probably took a survey, you would all say if you shop online, you'd probably go with the one business model that allows you to shop the quickest and gets to your house, correct? Uh, we won't say which companies. Well, that's what we did at PCC. We figured out, hey, what is the quickest way from sensor to shooter, that data flow to get down to the operations uh, and the fires to be able to affect the target? That's what we did. And so, you know, from an aviation standpoint, there's two pieces there. There's one of the, the deep fight that we look at uh, with our launched effects and also our manned platforms and then our close fight. For our deep fight uh, for PCC4, we focused on really out at the tactical edge with our, our, our payloads and our sensors. Uh, for example, how can we identify targets, provide that information back through the data thread 
and, and get back to a firing solution while also ingesting it in other mission commands. The one thing we had to do um, that we, we, once again, we know and that we will continue to have to work through is we're going to fly these launched effects in this lower tier. It presents a challenge with our communication and our network. So establishing that ability allows us to rapidly push that data back. A lot of people ask me, hey Kane, is that going to be the tendency from here on out? Well, until we you know, get our launch effects into a certain point with their behaviors, their collaboration, to be able to operate at the tactical edge at extended distances, that network is going to be critical. And so uh, between the network and the payloads uh, to identify you know, our integrated air defense, uh, we were able to successfully, successfully see data path back to Intel operations and fires in a pretty quick manner that made an inf impact on the enemy. Um, for the close fight, um, really we're talking 40 kilometers and in, we once again focused on our launched effects on that ability to assign it a mission, uh, provide that capability down to a tactical unit so they can control it off of their, um, their the communications equipment. Um, very, very successful in those handoffs and those behaviors. The other thing that I think uh, we stumbled into was our launched effects uh, due to the environment. Uh, we saw of, of all of our systems out there, um, when we got above about 30 to 45 knots, we were still able to successfully, successfully see launched effects as being a major co contributor as a sensor uh, on the battlefield. And so PCC4, we walk away with a, a lot of understanding on data threads, that extend in the network and then some uh, specific payloads that will continue to move um, with the S&T portfolio. Lastly, moving towards edge, uh, our upcoming FVL edge event will be in the fall in September. Uh, we've got a little bit different uh, focus this year. It is gonna be heavily focused on launched effects. Uh, to the point, I've asked the team to develop, uh, a lot of y'all remember the old stick slings uh, if you grew up in the Army, I asked for five sticks lanes. And two are aviation specific, focused on aviation threat. Two are focused on maneuver threat. And one's on an intel threat. And then we've asked industry to come um, and provide your capability. Don't worry about integrating into the network. We'll take care of that for you. But we want you to show up with your payloads, your device, your, um, your, your software. And then we'll give you the mission task and say, hey, let's see what you can do against these high-end threats to really get a sense where we are inside the industry on capability. And then we'll work that closely with, with David and his team. Uh, but I think it'll give us a holistic look of where we are uh, with capability right now with launch effects. So I'll hold there, David. Just to add on, uh, in one of the other discussions that we've had previously with some of our senior leaders, they ask us, what, how can we help you execute these, these very challenging missions at the speed of relevance that we really need to get this capability to our soldiers? And we really look back and, and we look at the appropriate use of our new authorities with the appropriate levels of rigor to make sure that we could deliver on the pace, this accelerated pace that we know technology is moving at. So again, we are using all of those new acquisition authorities military acquisition authorities, urgent capability acquisition. Yes, we're still executing multi-year contracts. We're still executing some major capability acquisitions in the aviation, and that's great. We've got a lot of sets of repetitions doing that, but we're building sets of repetitions on how to execute middle-tier urgent capability acquisitions, and we're using the appropriate contract vehicles. Some of those could be FAR-based contracts, some of those could be other transaction authority agreements. And that balance between the rigor and the speed is really what we're looking at across our portfolio to be able to then deliver the capabilities and then be able to iterate quickly. And you'll see that here on the schedule here in a moment. We won't steal the thunder about the individual programs quite yet. But just know that if, as you look across these uh, lines of effort, just in launched effects, we're looking at using the appropriate authorities that Congress has provided, that our Army senior leaders have supported us with. And that's a direct reflection of the feedback through the actual full chain of command all the way up to the, to the Pentagon and over to Congress. And they've supported us clearly, and we're now executing with those uh, new authorities and, and new vehicles. So that's been a great opportunity for all of us, I believe, in the Army. 
Uh, but we are embracing that in PO aviation as in you know, early adopters of those new authorities and, and capabilities. Before we go over to the uh, long technical schedule slide, to hit what General Phillips said regarding the new um, authorities, specifically for battalion and below UAS. Battalion and below UAS technology is moving at an incredible speed right now. Um, so we are not only are we fielding, in parallel to fielding, we are working on what's next. It is not a heel to toe in PMUAS, it's we're fielding and we're working on what's next at the same time. So for example, um, we are fielding short range reconnaissance. In parallel, we're working on the next thing and we're in a competition right now. Medium range reconnaissance is a direct requirement. I'm sure most of you saw that uh, request for proposals go out on March 31st, or excuse me, February 31st, it closes March 31st. So we haven't seen it, look at it. Um, and then lastly, you're going to see our LRR, Long Range Recon, another battalion level asset, 55 pounds and below. Uh, that'll go out in two weeks. That is how fast this one, one space is moving in the UAS um, perspective. And then moving on to the launch effects, you see the uh, schedule here. The, uh, the amount of support our senior leaders have given is absolutely tremendous. So I've seen a lot of you uh, at our industry day. The industry day we had for launch effects back in February. And this slide was shown. Uh, with that industry day, we shared a bunch of dates. And I can tell you today, we are absolutely 100% on time, on every, meaning every single date in the launch effects program. So right now, we're working on a LE uh, medium range. We're in prototyping there. We have five vendors that we're working with. We go to our operational demonstration at the end of this FY, getting all the data we need for senior leaders to make a fielding decision. That is fast. Knowing that we are doing it all from an open architecture approach. It, that is when, when the gentleman mentioned that that is a uh, that's something we don't compromise. It's very important. We are not compromising on that open system approach because the capabilities that we need, we don't even know what they might. We might need an FY28. We might get a non-traditional threat, but you know what? We are going to be in a position to get that new payload on there and to take that threat. Um, similarly, unclean vehicle control. Throughout the entire UAS portfolio, there is one command control system, whether it's for ground robots, UAS, and launch effects. Um, so highly recommend that um, you understand what that IOPs look like, what their shared interfaces are. Again, we're giving them all out to industry. So if you are an industry partner and you don't have our models, I ask that you ask for them. We gave them out to uh, the folks, everyone who uh, came to industry day. We want your feedback. We want to move fast, and the only way we can do that is we share exactly what we're doing. And then uh, I'll move it on to the short range uh, launch effects. That uh, request for uh, a bid proposal, that went out last week. We hit our timeline. So short range recon, that source of shot went out last week. Uh, we had a collaboration event just yesterday. And um, you'll see that formal request for white papers come out on Monday. We are moving fast. And we're going to have at least two vendors, minimum of two vendors. So this is a wide open space. We will not be vendor locked, uh, whether it's the air vehicle, whether it's a payload, whether it's a mission system. Because that would be, again, based on technology, that would not be the smartest thing to do. We need to ensure that we can move fast and stay under the threat. And then lastly, we have on that end of that schedule, we see the long range. That long range, uh, more of a core level asset, uh, that comes in in FY26, as you see in that schedule. It used to have a, um, a dotted line. Well, now we're funded. So you might have heard in February we were not funded. We are funded for long range today. Back to the uh, prioritization for launch effects. Ground and air. And um, working with our FELCFT and our Maneuver Center of Excellent uh, Teammates, we're getting after all those Army priorities. Okay, so I know we're running a little bit uh, probably over. Y'all have some questions. I'm sure some great questions for us. And, and I want to give you all a chance to uh, ask us. Uh, what I'll close with just from the field aviation perspective is that, like I said up front, uh, yes, have there been some priorities that have adjusted? Are there budgetary priorities that have been adjusted in 25 budget? Absolutely. But what you're seeing is that we are, our mission has not changed. We are still designing, delivering, developing, and supporting the very best aviation capabilities in the world and fielding those to our formations, to our soldiers, to our joint force, to our allies, and our partners. So it's great to see everybody here today, and I super appreciate the teamwork it takes to get here. It's a joint uh, teamwork between the Army and industry and across many formations in the Army to get where we're at today. We've got a lot of great momentum and very optimistic for the path ahead here for the rest of this year and next. So we look forward to your questions and we'll get to one of you.
No. Thanks, David. I just say uh, thank you uh, for one for attending, and then two, um, you know, as I start, I'll finish kind of where I started. Is Lost Effects is a very, very big portfolio. Um, it impacts. If you uh, if you touch a warfighting function, I would promise you they're looking at uh, launch effects. Doesn't matter if it's Intel, C2, um, Shane Upton's probably running around even on contested logistics on something about a launch effect. Uh, but I look forward uh, for those that are going to come out to Edge. Uh, we look for you out there, and uh, you know once again this partnership up here um, is just a portion of the broader body is uh, pushing this forward. And then lastly, I'll say is, I know I'll have a question, hey, uh, Ken, are you worried about the airspace? That's a different discussion uh, as we talked about all the different things flying through the air. Uh, and I'd be glad to you know, address that and how we got after that at PCC, but thank you. Okay, it sounds like we have the video. So instead of us sitting in front of it, we will clear out. Hi, thank you, John Judson with Defense News. Um, on the launched effects, um, I, I believe a year ago, um, wrote a story on how you're prototyping, and I saw on the schedule that yes, you did your prototyping, and it was a you know group of vendors that all came together to do that prototyping. And then you mentioned now that you're lo you're looking at having five vendors. Uh, can you? Just crystallize that a little bit more on what you're doing beyond the prototyping, or if you're, you know, what the decision point was um, with the prototyping effort and where you're going with that, if that's being open to a new competition or something. Yeah, <laughs> so. absolutely. Um, so when I spoke about the five vendors, that's in our medium range rapid prototyping. So right now we have begun that with the authority, with the eight, that prototyping, that was the five vendors. So we had the air vehicle, a mission system, and you know the, the TPA load vendors. So and then an integrator. So those are those five vendors coming together. And we did that intentionally to, from a MOSA perspective. If we're really open, let's have the five different vendors come in and work together. So that, that was the rapid prototyping. And we are still in it. We go to that news read about in 24, which will inform the production decision. The short range, um, that is, we're going to go for the initiation of that program here uh, in the fall. We went into the shaping panel with Mr. Bush. He gave us a thumbs up. And uh, that is what the request you saw hit the street just last week is for that short range. Okay. And that's up to two vendors. Okay, thank you for clarifying. And I'm sorry if I missed this, I came in a little late. On future tactical UAS, if you talked about that at all, um, I know there's a desire to move more quickly. Future tactical UAS hasn't gone as quickly as I think everyone wanted to see it go. Uh, what's the status on trying to move more quickly in that program um, or what you're thinking about in terms of the future of that program? So um, we are absolutely on schedule with that future tactical UAS rapid prototyping today. Uh, you're going to see us execute um, options three and four uh, for both our vendors. As a reminder, we started with five vendors. We're now down to two vendors. Um, and from an acceleration perspective, the Army is really wants us to accelerate that production. So we'll go to that production decision and lay in FY25, and we're ready to roll. And we're, we'll, we, right now, we're just buying the budget, so as we're funded, We'll be able to accelerate that program. Okay. Hi, uh, Matt Baynard from Defense Daily. Um, on the uh, broader acquisition approach and uh, approach and uh, projected schedule for launch defects, how has that been shaped by the decision to um, cancel FAR development and place a greater emphasis on filling that role with UAS and specifically launch defects? Are you moving? 
faster than kind of originally intended uh, with the uh, launch effects effort? Yeah, Matt, great question. Uh, what I'd like to say is that with the decisions that were made and the rebalance of the portfolio, the launch effects program, and you've probably seen some of this already uh, from our senior leader who brings some of the testimony that we are absolutely uh, adding resources to the launch effects program. So what that's enabled us to do is to integrate additional payloads faster. We'll be able to shift some of the uh, scheduled events for maybe the long-range launch effect. We'll bring that left. Uh, but overarching, we saw a, a robust investment into launch effects compared to where we were. We already had an aggressive schedule that we were moving out on. This just allows us to bring on more capability faster in these next coming years. And I, and I would say the timing um, was actually, actually almost perfect because uh, as we expanded launch effects to really the three categories, uh, that happened simultaneously. So our strategy actually grew a, another uh, category in there. So we went short, medium, and long now, as Danielle briefed. And so um, we've allowed now to actually go after each of those different categories as we see um, you know, those requirements from the, you know, for, for the formations that actually happen. So. This question was really a, a kind of a follow-up discussion to Edge, and so actually, you know, her question is here: Are we evaluating companies? Um, I will tell you, we're looking at how we take capability that's right now with industry and apply it to mission sets. So Edge is experimentation, demonstration, gateway event. What I'd ask the team was: Let's focus more on demonstration, and so let's look at uh, threat systems that you know core divisions and brigades would face and let's look at how they would employ launch effects either you know one to two launch effects or multiple launch effects with their payloads that would, would be able to sense it be able to transmit it and then you know provide a lethal solution to it if you needed to so it's more of a demonstration uh, we're very focused on some of the ranges that we're going to have to operate and extend against and then you know, the last piece is, is, is the software aspects that gets to the behaviors of how they're going to interact. Uh, you know, a lot of people talk about one-to-one, -one, one control, one person to one control of a launch effect. Uh, we've got to get one-to-many. And so that one-to-many means one controller to a lot of different vehicles that are operating together in a collaborative motion. That's another big piece we're looking at uh, to demonstrate out of edge. So, thanks, Ashley. One more, yeah, one more in the back. Sorry, Jen. So I would go back to what has been demonstrated and what are we looking to feel in these first tranches of capability and what's the delta feel, right? I think that's what the question is. So looking at that delta of what's been demonstrated, what's yet to, to be demonstrated, you see things like uh, collaborative teaming of one to say 10 vehicles. We haven't seen collaborative teaming demonstrated maybe one to say 100, right? 
maybe not to, to larger quantities of advanced teaming, autonomous capabilities. Those are the kind of things that are really going to be impactful on the battlefield. And so we're going after things we know are mature in our existing strategies and our existing requests for white papers, if you will, our RFPs. We're asking for mature things that we've seen that are demonstrated. But they've got those reach goals in there as well. Right? There's some objective capabilities in there. We don't think we've seen every good idea that's happening in the industry. We want to make sure we canvas all of industry to get the feedback and then see if there are some great opportunities there to potentially move some things to the left. So that's just one example. And I would say it's just that integration of new payloads and capabilities. We look at the payloads from an TRL, integration readiness level perspective as well. We've got a lot of great support from PO IEWS and PO Misses in Space there to help us look at the TRLs of those payloads. And I think as we look at the TRLs of those payloads, we're always looking to accelerate those into our strategy as soon as they become demonstrated and really not just in a lab, but we want to see that on an operational level. And then I'll just caveat that. So David talked about the software, the behavior, some of the payloads. The other piece we need to start getting to is what does this really look like being launched from the ground? You know, is this a self-contained container with multiple launch defects in it that are already synchronized that we can launch? I mean, I put it in the perspective of, you know, a formation somewhere, name your place on, you know, on the globe, that they've got to launch this. We have not really moved towards that. And so David and I and Danielle, we've talked a lot about this on, hey, how do we start advancing the capability? Is it truck mounted? Does it come off of a specific vehicle, self-contained, already powered, already synchronized? So that's one piece that you know Edge will help help us look at also is what does this really look like from a an employment methodology, okay? Okay, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Warriors Corner. Our next presenter will be presenting in one minute. OIB Modernization, Headquarters AMC, our Executive Direct Deputy Commanding General, Ms. Marion Wicker. And with her is Stephanie Hogan. We will begin. General for Army Material Command, and I want to introduce Ms. Stephanie Hoagland. She is the Director for the OIB Task Force, soon to be OIB Director. And what we want to do is talk to you about the Army's Organic Industrial Plan, the 15 year plan. Uh, how many people have heard Honorable Cameron Hill speak today? So we want to, we're going to talk about the defense industrial base, we're going to talk about organic industrial base, talk about national security and the things that we have to do to stay ready and ready. Nothing bigger than the OIB modernization plan. So what we're going to do is... Okay, Steph's microphone's loud and I'm sure we'll hear. So, and I'm a pacer, so I'm going to go to the next slide. Okay. So the Army, about uh, two years ago, we rolled out the OIB industrial plan, a 15-year modernization strategy to open our facilities. Why do we do it? For a number of reasons. Number one, our facilities are nearly, on average, 80 years old. The Army has 23 organic uh, facilities in its, uh, in its portfolio, depots, arsenals, and ammo plants. And we needed to make sure that we modernize for what's going on. So Congress laid down to the Army and said, we need to get your act together, we need to modernize our facilities, and what will it take? So it took about 18 months in total, uh, six months in earnest from October of 21 until March of 22, and laid out a 15-year modernization plan. I want to explain to you why we did it. So I said our facilities were 80 years old, that's absolutely true, but that's not why we needed to modernize. We needed to modernize for the three strategic imperatives we have up front. Number one, 
to get it modernized for the signature modernization systems we, we have coming in. When you think about what we call the 31 plus 4, or you know, the new systems coming in that the vendor talked about today, for uh, next generation squad weapon, next generation combat vehicle, we need to modernize for all of the systems that are becoming in the army. Modernizing without taking into consideration what's coming down the pipe in the next 10, 10 years or so is, is not a good modernization plan. We need to also modernize for our enduring systems. Those systems that are staying around, your M1, your Bradley's, your Humvees, your JLTV, all of these systems that the Army's going to continue to use. And then the last thing we have to do is sunset legacy capabilities that the Army no longer needs. Uh, the Army, by nature, sometimes are orders, and we keep a lot of things for the what if. We have to look at what things do we need to invest in so that we can bring something new in. So that's what really drove this. It wasn't the, the fact that our system, our facilities are 80 years old, it was we had some new strategic imperatives. So you think about a plan, five LOEs. So number one, we have to modernize our facilities, the places that we put stuff in. And yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, what we're going to do there. So we'll talk about the facilities. Mind bucket number two is modernizing our tooling and our processes. We have a lot of antiquated tooling. Think about papers. Uh, we have manual papers. We have dyed, gel, stasing, and sprayzing. We want to get up the papers. Think about our processes that we have. Mind bucket number three, and, and really important, is the human capital. When we change our facilities, we've also got to make sure that we modernize the workforce. Um, because right now there's great angst in if we modernize the facility, we we'll actually lose workforce. That's not true. You know, I come from Detroit, we modernized the auto companies, and they actually grew in the number of people because we needed different capabilities. And so we are embarking on a human capital plan to reskill and upskill our workforce. And that's one of the biggest things that we're doing this year. And I've got Miss Christina Freeze. Christina, can you raise your hand? So Christina is the AMC G1. She is leading our effort on the human capital plan. And we've already been working at Ernest on LOE 1 and 2. And this year, Miss Freeze is rolling out the human capital strategy. So people that have good ideas about uh, human capital revolution, evolution, can see Miss Freeze while she's here the next couple of days. LOE number 4, really important and really uh, Got talked about this morning. When you think about our facilities, 80 years old, uh, the good thing is not a lot of cyber vulnerabilities because they're old, right? They're not, they're not networked like they should be. But as we embark on a plan to modernize them with equipment that is now going to be potentially so cyber vulnerable, we've got to rescale our, our thinking in terms of IT, cyber, uh, integrated control networks, all of those things that we previously hadn't done. And then line of effort number four is really power and energy. When you do a modernization of this scale, you have to make sure that you have the power and the energy sufficient to, to do this. And so those are really the five main line of efforts that AMC is going after in the OIB plan. It asks the very first question, why 15 years? Well, number one, uh, the cost alone, $18 billion. If you don't plan it over a period of time, it's just not going to happen. But more importantly, even if someone said, okay, we need $18 million, I'm going to hand it to you, I'm still going to do it. Because our OIB facilities have to continue running, have to continue doing the things that we need them to do in parallel. And so our OIB plan is, is thought out, it's, it's, it's based on continuous operations, and then modernization on the fly. So we have to mix those two things. So what we are doing is a three, three phases, five-year plan. And that's what Congress is really looking for from us is give us five year chunks of what's going to do. So phase one, we're going to really rebuild to a 21st century capability. No problem there. Phase two, we're going to continue on with it, particularly as we roll out some more of our new system. And then phase three, equally important, is continuing them to take care of that which is modernized. So when you think about that third phase is don't let these facilities become 80 years old again because we've done nothing. And so we've got a, a great plan. You can, you can look on the slide and, and we'll make those available for everybody. But what, you know, what we're trying to do is a, a variety of products. When you do something of this 
failed to have people say, okay, how are you prioritizing this? And so we're prioritizing it in a couple of ways. Number one, we've looked at all of our dental arsenals and nanoplants, prioritized them one to end. But we've also looked at what's important. Waiting signature modernization versus enduring versus getting rid of something. We also looked at priorities of our life cycle management plans. Looked at life, health, and safety versus routine maintenance versus sunset. So there's about five different elements that go into our plan, and, and this kind of just teases it all out for us. So let me go to the next slide. So how do you manage a 15-year, $18 billion plan? You better have a good management decision tool, not a database. Because if, you know, a database can just throw all your stuff in there and you can't do any yeah. decisions with it. So what we came up with was what was called Vulcan. And Vulcan actually named for the, the woman god of the Forge and Foundry down in Birmingham, Alabama. So we named our system Vulcan. Uh, Tony McQueen over there might remember a, a system called Tiberius, which was also, this is really, when you, when you think about what we did here, it was a takeoff of what we did on managing the nation's vaccine program. Uh, back then, General Perna wanted a management decision tool to manage complex things. So we took a page out of Operation Warp Speed and built a management decision tool. Why do you need a management decision tool? So that you don't make back of the envelope decisions. You know, most of you have been involved with budgets. More often than not, when we get a budget cut, we salami slice and everybody takes a piece of it. That's not the way to manage a 15 year plan. So what we do here is all of our projects are prioritized one to end. So if we have a cut, we can cut appropriately from the bottom up. But also we have linkages in there. So let's say for example, I've got a cut in 25 and I can, I can look at a project that's slated to be cut, but I can see that we already invested two years into it and, and we're in year three. So we can, management can now make those real-time decisions. Um, the Army asks for supplementals. What do you what do you need to go faster? You know, before that's something that would probably take us five, six weeks to put together. Now this takes us maybe two or three days to go through, revalidate. Here's what the Army can do. Here's what we can move to the left. Here's what we can move to the right. Or we can't do it because we haven't gotten all of our things. So really, um, one of the crown jewels of the OIB plan is a modernization management decision tool that everybody has access to from the government side and can make informed decisions. So that's, you know, that's one of the things I just kind of want to show everybody. Next slide. So the OIB plan was really supposed to start in 2024 and train hit. And Congress came to us last year and said, we have seen your plan, great plan. What if we give you money? What can you pull left? Well, again, by using Vulcan, we could pull left. Originally, we were slated, the Army was slated to get about $1.1 billion in 23 because we were ready, because we had a plan, and predominantly for our arsenal for our ammo plans, an additional $1.5 billion in 23 the Army was now ready to execute and, and do what they needed to do. That didn't happen just by itself. A lot of planning and you know, play industry, academia has played a big part in this. What I wanted to show, what I wanted to show you here is just some highlights you can see on the uh, things we're doing. So, Cody Hanna, microelectronics. I'm going to talk about them for a little bit. And one of the Army's biggest problems is microelectronics. We, we have a lot of contractors that are kind of getting out of the marketplace on some of the things that we need. When you think about circuit cards, and the things the Army needs to keep our vehicles for a long time. Kobe Hanna is going to become the Army's service uh, area for microelectronics. So we're working modernization programs to build them up. Casting and forging. So uh, we've got Rock Island, JMTC. I don't know if Colonel Guide is here. If it is, he'll raise his hand. If you haven't been to Rock Island Arsenal, go there. It's, it's our home of two things now. Additive manufacturing. So the jointless hull, which is a 20 by 30 machine that can, you can add in manufacture print uh, giant things now. But we've done all the added manufacturing. But the other part, the second thing that's a big problem with the Army is casting and forgings. And so every, every OEM I talk to, I'm having problems with casting and forgings. So I would tell anybody that's looking for casting and forgings, uh, go over and see Rock Island Arsenal, where we're on the other side of the wall here, and talk 
to them about that. So we are investing from an army modernization program on areas that industry sees as a problem and then the army sees as a problem as well. But we've got many other different projects. Um, but, but again, we, we want to highlight the fact that the army was ready a year ahead of time. So we weren't going to start a program until October of 2030. We started it a uh, full year early because we had a plan. So that's just great thing for us. Next slide. So where do we need your help? There are partnerships to come around here. Uh, we, are, we are looking for people that want to be uh, public private partnerships. Right now, uh, the Army has about 140 of them at our OIG facilities. I'd love to see that number grow. So, you know, what, what are those kind of things? It, it could be use of our machinery. If you think about Waterville Elite Arsenal, they have machines that a contractor uh, rents time on. Right? And then when we need it, we use it. Classroom forging, we've already talked about that. We're going to need a lot of help uh, and ideas on our workforce and training our workforce. We're going to need a lot of great ideas on you know, IT and modernization and um, building out integrated control networks. What we're not looking for, though, is 23 different answers. We're looking for enterprise corporate solutions. If you think about, again, the auto companies, which was my growing up back then, um, Ford wouldn't have an ICN, a different ICN in every one of the facilities. They would have a, a standard of them. That's what we're looking for. We're looking to do uh, your contracts for category management. I see a mistake back there and should be happy that I'm talking with that. So when we're, when we're buying HVAC systems, we're looking at potentially buying them from multiple locations rather than every single one differently. But we want industry to come in, come in and tell us the problems come in and share space, come in and tell us what we're looking for. Um, there are a lot of areas that we don't have the expertise in, so we will want people to come in and talk to us about it. So, uh, Ms. Hoagland here is the OID lead. Um, I think she probably got plenty of business cards that she can hand out. But Steph, I'm going to give you a couple minutes if you want to say anything to the group, otherwise we'll go right to questions. All right, let's go to questions. Steph's uh, Steph on so how about questions? Okay, if no one has a question for me, I'll ask a question for you. Alright, Beth. Here, I'll walk over to you. I'm like a game show host. <laughs> what did I win? <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Wicker, for putting on this. I think as a phase three so we're looking at new technologies and how we can help modernize and speaking with your team, what, what really is the best way to engage? Is it the industry day or, or what feedback can you give us? Well, that's a great question. So we've had multiple events. And so we have industry days, we have days like today. Get your business cards to Ms. Hoagland. Uh, her and her team are around here. Can all the OID team members please raise your hand? So we've got one, two, Aaron's over there. We've got probably about five or six of them that we can make sure you get business cards to you from there. You know, we have different forums. So uh, Steph has led probably 15 forums since the beginning of the fiscal year. So there are multiple venues. And, and there are also venues for contractors to compete for some different OIB modernization money too. So I'd encourage you to talk to Ms. Holman. Okay? Who else has a question? Come on, 15 years, 18 billion dollars. There's got to be questions and concerns. There you go. Hi, I'm from the bottom. Sorry about that. Um, I noticed in your slides you have um, facilities as one area and line of effort, and then you have cyber security in another. And so I, I would like you to maybe consider when you're looking at a little bit, because as you talk about industrial control systems and operational technology, I think we've been too focused on the IT side of cyber for so long that we may have lost sight of the fact that if the grid is attacked, the rest of it doesn't really matter. So um, maybe in terms of priority or at, at least in what step as your phases may go on. So I'd uh, really just a comment. Oh, thanks, Andy. This is, you know, that's a great comment. So the reason we have it said here is because not everything, everyone needs the same thing. So for example, if somebody has a brand new facility, I'll talk about Toby Hanna. So Toby Hanna has, in the last 10 years, probably done nearly 900 million in modernization. So they may not need the facilities, they may not need the tooling, 
but they may need the integrated control network. And so what that isn't is a one size for everybody. It is here's all of the different things that we know somebody will need some part of. And so that's kind of the way, but I appreciate your feedback. And, and you know, it's, it's always good to make sure that we are linking uh, the facilities with the control networks. But I think that's one of the things that we didn't do. Think about when we put our ERP in there back in 2010, 2009. We just ran a lot of cable in haphazardly through buildings because that's what we had to do at the time. But to your point now, as we're looking at these facilities, let's make sure that it's all done and locked up together. Appreciate that. Somebody else with a question back here? Uh, thanks, man. Uh, Sam Scope, Defense One. So I was wondering if you could contextualize how much capacity the various um, locations are at, uh, and if you ever uh, thought about using excess capacity that you have to help some of the private sector industrial uh, gaps. I mean, Gimler's production, for instance, has been famously stymied. Are there things that the uh, OIB could do to, to help that? Either? Yeah, so in terms of capacity, it would depend on the respective place. You know, 23 of them, um, the capacity at Anderson Army Depot is different than the capacity at Letter County. So it depends on what projects. I will tell you right now, Letter County, uh, Anderson is cranking a lot of work through for the Ukraine. But to your point, uh, Sam, absolutely, if, that's where we want industry to come to us. If there are some things that they need to do in, in, in the facilities or buildings we have or machine sharing, Absolutely. So I think there's always opportunities to do that. Um, we do have some pockets of excellence where they do that. Uh, we also have, you know, places Rock Island, for example. Um, they do a they do a cooperative partnership with one of the OEMs. The OEM has the vehicle, and then they come on and build the uh, the, the product. And we did ambulances, for example. Uh, and then General did the ambulance, brought them to Rock Island, and then as a partnership from a facility perspective. We built the ambulance kits and then slapped them all together. So a absolutely, and that's what we want to continue to do. Thanks, Sam. Look forward to talking to you tomorrow. Thank you. Great. You want to ask another question? Uh Thank you, Mr. Maker. I heard you speak of the different lines of effort, and you spoke of being ready so that you were able to receive an additional $1.5 billion in funding. Hmm. Hypothetically speaking, if assuming that you continue to be continuously ready with your modernization tool. Can you share what the next steps might be if another half a billion or one billion would just happen to be available? So we absolutely can. You know, uh, a lot of the focus right now is building out the ammo plants. We were, we were low for, in, for a number of years in some of the things about ammo plants. So in, in one of the greater needs right now, building out ammo plants. So I, I think if if, we had to, if I had to just pull a number out of the air right now, we would see prioritization for animal plants. I think Ivo uh, Pomeria talked about that this morning. But there's also several of our buckle facilities that you know, we need to expand and, and, and build things. We've got buildings that are kind of patchwork together. So it would depend on the type of funding. It would depend on what mission it's, it's going to. But Greg, to answer your question, probably more ammunition focus something very new to me. Got a question? Hey, Bernhard, how are you doing? Hi, Bernhard. So you um, mentioned for the modernization. So for industry, what are your top three challenges that you probably want us to walk away with today and say, hey, I think I'm going to have a solution and come back as soon as I'm going to Castings and forging, microelectronics. I'm going to give you four. Uh, ICN, Integrated Control Networks, we don't have the experience with that in human capital. We have to make sure that, and, and you're always looking for how do you use other people's money or, or, or different solutions. For our human capital, and I'll just give you a little bit, when a double arsenal ammo plant has to pay for all the modernization of the people, it goes into their rates. It's a, it's a zero sum for them. And so one of my jobs is how do I find additional funding, the Department of Labor, the Department of Education, to help upskill and reskill our workforce. You don't worry about that part. What, I, what, I, what we're looking for is what are your good ideas. And so, again, casting and forging, industry-wide, we're having a problem with that. We're having a problem with microelectronics. When you think about Bradley circuit cards, Bradley sensors, a lot of obsolescence with that. So we need help with that and building out that capability. 
and then certainly, as I mentioned, integrated control network, we just don't have the expertise for that. And so people that understand industrial based facilitation and, and how to put those things in and what are the right things to do, that's what we're looking for. And then always, first and foremost, the people. Um, they're, they're our most valuable asset. And so how do you take that person that was the painter that did it from a, a manual perspective and now he's, he or she is going to be the person that is uh, running that automated paint machine and calibrating it and, and programming it. So it's going to be a, a upskilling and reskilling. And, you know, and a lot of that, when you're changing people's jobs, there's a lot of angst with that. And so we've got to make sure that whatever we put in place, we're communicating to the workforce as well. Thanks for the question. Anybody else? All right. Last chance. All right, so, so look, at, we've got Ms. Stephanie Hoagland. Um, we've got a lot of opportunities here to talk to people. Please find our OIB team. If you can't find our OIB team, just on the other side, there are a couple of our depots represented there. We can certainly get questions there. But I want to thank everybody for your time today and your investment in the OIB, which is you know, the nation's national security fund. Thank you. Am I hot? Good. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. So we're the last panel before they can actually go out and have probably a nice beer or something after this. So we're going to keep them over a little longer just because that's who we are and what we do. But I wanted to start off. My name is Joan Ray. I'm the Network Cross-Functional Team Director and I've got a panel of team members here. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. But I wanted to open it up and kind of set the stage to the discussion we're going to have today on the electromagnetic spectrum. I, I took a lot of interest in this particular event what, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years now. So let's imagine that the years, just 2025, biggest concern I have is imagine that you're trying to drive and go somewhere and stoplights stop working, you go to the gas station, all the pumps are down. You know, our leaders are being tracked all over the world because we all have our cell phones in our hand. We're out in the battlefield operations and there's more cell phones just giving away our positions. Unable to hide in plain sight. That's a concern that all of our leaders currently have today. And we want to have just stop by and have a discussion on how you can help us across our forces, not only the Army. This is, a, this is a bigger problem than just the Army problem. Hiding in plain sight and the spectrum, understanding it. We took 20 years off during the last war and not really focused on the spectrum. And now we are because our enemies have advanced in their capabilities to find us on the battle space. And the help that we need from you is, is just that. How do we allow commanders to see themselves, one? Two, how do we increase the training so our soldiers, our leaders can understand what it looks like to be in the spectrum? And then is there capabilities out there that can reduce the power on the systems that we're using, smart power that can reduce the, the output so that we are hiding in plain sight? That's the discussion we want to stop by right now and just have with you and just well, we'll take questions at the end, but we brought a commander along who's going to tell you specifically, you know, his concerns from his operational view of the battlefield. So I'll pass the mic over. Thanks. Sir, thank you. Uh, Colonel Tom Getke, I'm the 10th Mountain uh, Devardi commander, uh, and just going to share uh, perhaps a couple observations uh, from my approach as a uh, unit commander. Uh, I see it two different ways. Uh, and, and I'd like to 
uh, pull the string on this a bit. Uh, so first, I, I'm dual-hatted. Uh, my first job is as the division fire support coordinator. Okay, and in that function, uh, I lead the targeting process for the division. Secondly, I'm a functional brigade commander that owns a number of the critical assets uh, to employ uh, in a LISCO environment for the division. Uh, so the first uh, approach or the first way I look at this is that the EMS uh, is the first form of contact, always. Okay, we, we sense to make sense. So we look at the electromagnetic uh, environment and, and it identifies something is there. We don't know quite what it is, uh, but we take that sensory information and then we couple it with our intel team uh, to make sense of it. Uh, and if we do that correctly uh, and it meets the attack guidance uh, standards that we've set and the target selection standards that we've set, uh, then it ultimately sets us up uh, for a strike. So that's the first uh, kind of vantage point that I'm looking at this problem set. Uh, the second is that the EMS crosses all domains. Okay, so when I look at it, uh, I look across the Army as a service uh, and the joint force, and I, and I pull all of those capabilities together, and I say, really what that is, is that's the assets available that I have to strike a target, okay? Um, and then lastly, just putting my functional brigade uh, commander hat on, uh, I look at it from a critical vulnerability standpoint. Uh, I own Q53 radar, uh, the Sentinel radar. Uh, I am the force field artillery headquarters for the division. I am the division's alternative uh, command post. Uh, and so all of those concerns, the exposure, uh, how do I mitigate that exposure and survive uh, on the contemporary battlefield? Uh, with those concerns, uh, we, uh, the team kind of came together and thought, how do we uh, rehearse this? Coming at it from you know, juxtaposing these two uh, positions, we said, well, hey, wh why don't we develop a training series? Uh, our training series is called Hunter EMS. And essentially what it does, the electronic uh, surveillance hunters uh, against a critical asset or what we do, organic radars, uh, they go hide. We essentially say, radars, you go hide. Sensors, you go hunt them. Uh, and, and it's a scrimmage, essentially, a, a cat and mouse game uh, where we frequently go, go back and forth and can iterate frequently and, and kind of sharpen our own skills uh, from an individual and unit standpoint. Uh, from the hunter side, we have PR200, spectrum analyzers, a number of other assets. Uh, started out uh, kind of from a terrestrial uh, based system and then integrated the third dimension in, in a number of ways. But really what they've learned is uh, the value of teaming. If you send three teams out there, they've got to learn uh, how to identify a, a line of bearing, how to identify a side lobe, conduct a resection, a, a triangulation uh, to reduce that target location error uh, to a threshold where we can actually strike a target. So how they team together and then how they communicate with each other uh, is critically important. On the other side, uh, the critical assets, the radars, are also in, in a teaming function. It's not just the radars that I own. You couple all of the radars in the 10th Mountain Division into a target array. Where they're up, then they're down. They're up, they're down. They're covering the same area, but they're mitigating their exposure. Uh, they have uh, very disciplined emission control. Um, the second, uh, the, the number of, you have a number of other pieces with that, uh, the terrain masking, uh, but probably the biggest piece from a, a critical vulnerability standpoint is getting the soldiers, uh, these young NCOs to understand that you're always being hunted. As soon as your uh, system turns on, you can be identified in the electromagnetic spectrum, okay? Uh, that's a, a bit of a hump to get over that as soon as you're up and operational, somebody's trying to hunt you and kill you, okay? Your goal is to stay outside of a targetable threshold uh, so that they might see you, they might know what's out there, but stay out, of, out at a distance, uh, out of a target location error uh, where they're not going to choose, uh, you're not gonna meet their target selection standards or their attack guidance, and so they choose not to strike you. Uh, that's a bit uh, of a hurdle to overcome, but their mission has ultimately become uh, hard to kill. 
And, and so Hunter EMS continues to iterate on this cat and mouse game, uh, throwing complexity at, at each uh, iteration. Uh, but we've uh, been incredibly, I, I, I would assess uh, we've achieved success because it, one, it's hard to do, and two, there's not many ways to go about it. It requires a lot of creativity uh, to kind of actually practice operations in the electromagnetic spectrum. So that's just the Tenth Mountain story, and, and we can discuss further if anybody's got any questions. Sir? Awesome. Thanks. I'm uh, Brigadier General Ed Barker. I'm the uh, Program Executive Officer for Intelligence and Electronic Warfare and Sensors, so Aberdeen Proving Grounds. So thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Thanks for the opportunity with the team, sir. Appreciate it. I uh, just want to give a quick shout-out to our uh, uh, – shout-out some love to our friends in Baltimore. Uh, given everything that happened this morning, I tell you, uh, you know, as part of the Aberdeen family, we're very close to that 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 area, and it's not uncommon for you know our employees to commute in you know in that space. So, uh, thoughts and prayers for them. Um, so, you know, the Army is really focusing on you know reducing uh, you know the static command post, you know, the signature, and ensuring that our commanders have the freedom of maneuver and the and the need to do uh, you know C2 at the time and place that they want, right? And so for my foxhole as the PEO delivering a lot of the capabilities, I mean, that's what I'm trying to do is make sure that, uh, that the commanders have the tools uh, you know, to do just that. So efforts like our electronic warfare planning and management tool, our situational awareness system, um, our spectrum situational awareness system, and also our uh, modular EMS uh, system, those are some of the tools that we're using to get at that. Uh, from an EWPMT, we want that commander to have the means to be able to manage all the EW assets in his space, uh, to remotely control them if needed, and to really inform the decisions that he's making, uh, he or she is making you know, across the EMS. Um, from an S2AS standpoint, that is, you know, it, it, what, what we're really learning right now is that is a critical need. You need to be able to understand not only what you look like within the EMS, um, but where are you being influenced? What does the blue signature look like? What does your signature look like? Where are the conflicts? And making sure that you understand and you have that situational awareness so you can manage uh, and, uh, and, and mitigate the risk is what it really boils down to from a capability standpoint. And then on the modular EMS system, think of that in terms of it's really about obfuscation and hiding you know, hiding in the open, hiding in the noise, um, and confusing the enemy. And that's what we want to be able to give them to, you know, the tools to do um, so as they manage that across, uh, you know, their portfolio. And then the, the reality is from a, from a risk standpoint, you know, opportunities like the Hunter EMS, I mean, we got to continue to leverage those. If you guys have not experienced or seen what they're doing or had the opportunity to go up to Fort Drum, um, you, you know, I would, I would offer you to, you know, take the opportunity to do it. There's a lot of investments. Uh, we look at it as a great opportunity to partner and get soldier feedback uh, across our EW portfolio. Um, and, and what you see up there is it really validates that, you know, that need. It really validates the need for the commander to be able to have the tools, you know, to confuse the enemy to the point where the enemy, he may see something there in the spectrum, but they just can't pinpoint it. And something as simple as that, and you know, giving them a lack of understanding so that they know know exactly what is there, that's the critical part. You know, something as little as that. And you know, we're going to continue to you know have lessons learned coming out of the different AORs. Um, all of that is going to continue to inform the requirements. It's going to continue to inform our investment strategies. Um, and the reality is that EMS is. You know, it's a smaller part of the ecosystem from an EW standpoint that we just have got to continue to, uh, to do better in and to refine. It, it feeds into the larger narrative from an Army standpoint that we, uh, you know, given the, the focus on COIN for so many decades, you know, a lot of these, uh, you know, capabilities, a lot of the expertise is atrophied and, you know, so we're working to rebuild that and we're going to continue to do it. And, um, so we look, like I said, you know, we look for great partnerships with, with folks like the 10th Mountain. We're going to continue to do that, um, and we're going to continue to make sure that our commanders have the best tools that they can when it comes to manage themselves in, within the EMS. And I'm going to turn it over to my good friends, Mark Kitts. It's always great. It's always nice having the guy that has been in your organization for 14 years prior to you, and then he was your boss for two years. It just makes these speaking engagements so easy because I've got, like, the ultimate phone-a-friend. Okay, 
Or at a minimum, I know he's going to correct me. No, no, no. Ed, the answer's in the right-hand drawer of your desk. I, I thought you were just going to blame me. <laughs> I thought that was what was said. Uh, uh, Mark Hicks, I'm a PE for C3P. I'm the network PEO. And uh, I just wanted to build on a couple of things Tom and Ed said. Uh, you know, one of the things that we learned when we, when we observed what was happening in the Ukraine, we learned that operations and spectrum changed over time, right? Significantly, where today, the fight looks very different in spectrum than it did two or three months after the conflict started. And so Tom talked a lot about how are we dispersing our command posts? How are we setting up and, and building discipline in our formation in how we emit or how we present dilemmas to the enemy. And so I, 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 there's two things I want to talk about very quickly. One is, how are we enabling commanders with a modular command post? How are we enabling commanders to not build static command posts, but give them options in how they get after building their command posts or setting up their command posts? Because this idea that Tenth Mountain is going to encounter the same fight that 25th ID is going to encounter would, would be a fallacy if we if we built the same command post infrastructure for those two divisions because they're going to fight in very different ways. And, and the second thing I want to talk about, which John Ray talked about, was was how do we hide in plain sight? And, and we talk about that being a technology problem. We talked about that being uh, how we leverage technology. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so first. I wanted to talk about our command posts, right? How today we deliver command posts to our army is very much how we deliver radios, right? Here's your command post. Uh, and, and we're working to change that concept. And so in 1011, we engage with industry on a few RFIs. In 1012, we're gonna be showing some prototypes and, and getting after building some capabilities. So what I'd like to be able to do is give the division commanders, give brigade commanders, options and how they employ their command posts. Now what does that mean in reality? That means each of these divisions are fighting on different combat platforms. ISVs for the lights, JLTDs for the heavies, even AMPs for the heavies, uh, strikers in their striker formations. Some formations are fighting strikers even when they're not a striker formation. So how do we give those commanders a modular way to employ their network, employ their CQ capabilities, so that they can shoot, move, and communicate in a way that allows them to fight in the way that they want to fight, not the way that the equipment dictates that they fight. And so really, I'm challenging industry. How do you build an agnostic to platform power capability so we can do SATCOM on the move, that I can do robust ITN or lower tactical video formations so that I can get to much smaller and so Tom did a fantastic job of outlaying sort of the operational dilemma, but we on the material side have to give him options so he can employ his radar battery, he can employ his, his main CP in a much more modular way so he can move much faster, or he can set up static for his full ops if he needs to. Uh, giving that commander options, I think, is the key to the future of our command posts. And that, I think, is a huge challenge to industry, and I'm looking forward to hearing the options that you can provide. Uh, the second is this concept of hiding in plain sight, right? If, if we could provide commanders the opportunity where they can see themselves and the spectrum around them, uh, and then give them opportunities to communicate in ways that look the exact same way that the rest of the environment is, I think is the panacea of where each of the core commanders want to get to. And so Ed talked about how we give the commander the ability to see themselves. Now I think our job on the network side is giving them options to communicate the same way that, that the rest of the environment is communicating. Whether that's 5G, 4G, even 3G in some parts of the world, whether that's Wi-Fi, how do I deliver a commercially based solution that provides those dilemmas to the targeting opportunity, right? And so I, I think industry has a lot of opportunities to provide us those commercial ways uh, to communicate in that hiding in plain sight. I'm looking forward to working with industry on that. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll conclude my remarks and I'm looking forward to your, uh, to your questions.
Yeah, and I'll add one thing. And, and you said disperse, and you do want the commanders to be also digitally connected while they're moving. That's a big point. I, I'm sure that's exactly what you're looking for. So we look forward to your questions. There you go, right there. Thank you, sir. Hi, uh, Scott Porter from Talis. Thank you for calling out our Maryland uh, neighbors. Yes. I just drove over that bridge this weekend. Oh, oh boy. God. Um, let's see. Mark, I know you're an EW cool kid. You can't the mic. You weren't supposed to ask me. <laughs> huh? I thought he was getting a pass there. All right, I know this isn't an EW question. Uh, you know, when uh, Secretary Pelley was approving the opening remarks yesterday, one of the very first things Yeah, so we're, we're running a radio as a service pilot right now, right, which is uh, out on the street and uh, uh, very close to a ward, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, really, we want to engage with industry on where is our return on investment if we go to an as a service model. I think, you know, one of the things is being new to the network that was surprising to me is you go to a lot of units and they have a lot of radios at the ready, right? Not necessarily being used. Uh, even when units go to JRTC, they're using less than 50% of the radios that we equip the unit. Um, so nobody wants to be in the business of giving radios to units that, that are not gonna necessarily leverage all those radios. And so what we really wanna get, what the Army wants to get to is an on-demand model, right? We want units to use the radios that they're being given and then when they need capacity, we have an on-demand model to do that. Now, there's a lot that goes into the relationship with industry in this as-a-service model. And I really see what the under talked about today, or what we're going after with this pilot program, is a dialogue with industry. Where are the breakpoints? How can we make sure we give these commanders the radios they need to deploy now, and the radios that they could need when they need capacity to increase? And so I think there's really a dialogue, Scott, and I'm looking forward to that dialogue with industry. He also mentioned SATCOM as a service, so I'm gonna use this as an opportunity. I think that's a much more uh, a mature option, right? I think uh, the, the industry is much more mature. There's a much more robust commercial demand. And so I think we're gonna much more aggressively pursue SATCOM now and engage with the dialogue with industry on radio as a service. And so hopefully that gets after your questions. Thank you. Sir, uh, Travis Lewis with Next Gen Federal. I had a question about you know, the EWPMT and the EMBM and the relationship on the joint community and the EW fight. What's kind of the future that you see as a strategic requirement, you know, synchronizing the joint fight uh, with the Army systems uh, in the EW domain? Yeah, so uh, EWPMT, obviously Army requirement, um, I think it feeds into the larger JADC2 conversation. Um, when it comes to that, there's a lot of opportunities uh, within the space right now to, to get after those. Um, I think one of the things you're seeing, and it's really across the portfolio, is some of the foundational elements that we're doing. Titan, as an example, uh, you know, one of those good uh, placeholders from that standpoint. And then the uh, you know some of the work that we're doing from a commonality aspect. Uh, when it comes to again, I'll go into the integrated sensor architecture and understanding you know, you know that type of commonality CMFF. Um, CMOS and all those different open standards, that's what's really laying the foundation for that, that common JADC2 conversation, and I think that's what feeds into the larger joint requirements. Okay, so yeah. you're still going to kind of keep the, the Army requirements? Yeah, Maybe yeah, more. absolutely. All right. yeah. Thanks. And, and I would say, you know, EMBM, EWPMT is another example of this blending of enterprise and tactical, right? And I think you're seeing that certainly in the network. And so the JADC2 opportunity that Ed talked about is really, you know, on the network side especially, right, this display, we're not going to talk about a tactical network and an enterprise network anymore. We're going to talk about one Army network. You know, same for EW. We're going to talk about EW as a holistic capability as, 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 as integrated with JADC2. So I, I think I got it right. 
Jalen picked very much for comments and uh, insights. Brian Pick from NKST Technologies. Um, with that high retain site and the EMS centric approaches, how soon do you think they'll be putting it in the, the battle labs? Like the control battle lab or the new battle lab? Yeah, I'll uh, go first, then I'll give it to General Ray. So, so right now we're doing 4G technologies, right? So, so we're already experimenting. Um, I think we're challenging industry on how does hide in plain sight apply more broadly, right? So, if the EMS uh, environment in Indo-PACOM looks very different than it does in UCOM, how can I build a flexible solution or a modular solution to hide in plain sight in the different AORs around the world? Because that's not, you know, buy a program and a bunch of serial numbers, right? It's, it's okay, how do I get after a portfolio of capability and what should that portfolio look like? Um, and, and then how do you drive that sort of at scale? That, that's kind of, you know, sort of what we're looking at. But Joe Ray, I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, just real, so from a SDOS standpoint, good example. Uh, that's a new start in 25. We already have RFIs out on the street looking at existing capabilities. We fully anticipate that'll be a, a, a COTS type solution. Uh, MEMS as an example, uh, 26 new start, uh, we're seeing what's out there, RFIs as well, um, and just waiting to see how that competes in the palm. So. I think we're good. Thanks, uh, same story with the first one. Um, so, slightly different topic, uh, when it comes to our own systems being examined, uh, there's a lot of evidence from Ukraine that the precision weapons we gave uh, were jammed by the Russians, not always hitting the target correctly. Um, how, how concerning is that to you from an EW perspective, and, and what are we doing or can be done to harden precision weapons to make them more resistant to EW? Thank you. I, I can offer you some feedback, uh, maybe not answer the question directly, but uh, as an institution, we need to work on the submission of 1494s and work on how, if we're going to incorporate jammers, if I go out into my backyard and want to try and jam my own systems just to continue to sharpen my, uh, my team, uh, that's a work in progress. It takes a long lead time. There's a ton of coordination that goes into that. Uh, stepping that up, uh, doing that for GPS is, is way harder. Uh, I will just tell you, in one of the early Hunter EMS, um, you know, iterations, uh, we just had to shut it down. Just shut it down because we had the local Carthage Hospital, we had the Watertown Airport, and, and frankly, we have Canada right there, and you can't bleed over into any of those, and you just got to be very careful. So it's a, a kind of a precision-based approach, but we do need to find, if each unit is going to go out and, and practice in their backyard, uh, that is something that we have to work toward. So there, there's definitely some opportunities in the space uh, when it comes to um, you know, how you can achieve precision when it comes to that. Uh, the other aspect of things right now is um, when you're looking at M code as a possibility, right? So the Space Force just came online in late February. Uh, that constellation is now active. Um, we have done some of our uh, you know, GPS denied environments, testing for our maps and our DAPS systems, highly successful in that area. Those are the first ENCODE uh, capable uh, systems. And so what, you know, I, you know, one of the things I know that we're looking at from an Army standpoint is uh, with that coming online, so what's our investment strategy going forward to get at the kind of legacy kit that has either SASM or other, you know, GPS sources uh, you know that are not MCO compliant, and so that's one of the things I know we have as a do out from a service standpoint. We're going to be working. I think it gets back to you know one of the points I made earlier is that we have to understand, and, and the training is going to have to take place so we understand the spectrum. It's been, it's been 20 years since we've really operated in it. And I think we're a little bit behind, and I think it's going to take a lot of training so we can understand what we look like and, and how do we protect ourselves within the spectrum itself. Thank you. So, um, from the perspective, we've heard about this in the world now. It's safe for us all. There was a report in the world welcome. We responded. But we never heard the word back. So, like, when we're asking for this, I know Mr. Rose is not here to defend that. But, like, hey, to get that 
feedback to say, hey, you know, there was some innovation, there was feedback, hey, we had some interest, but there was never any kind of follow through. So I just think the ask is, you know, just kind of within the benefit of both, you know, hearing back and having engagement in that next one three, but then in other avenues, we don't hear back. If we want to bring innovation into here, other unique if, you know, partnerships, how do we get that feedback? How do we know if we're hitting the mark or not? It would be beneficial. All of it's a feedback across the board, but the C5 community is that place to do that. But if we don't get feedback, how do we know to take the next step? Or how do we know where we're going? We're just, I know you guys are trying to improve that, but it's just, just an ask of like, how could we improve that? So. Yeah, no, th Jason, thanks. And, and I apologize, I don't know the Vulcan specific, right? To, ho ho hope you're doing well. Um, um, but I will say this, right? At C3T and Network CFT, we run a twice year TEM with over 1,500 attendees. Uh, this year, General Ray and I are doing a whole day of one on ones uh, in the first day. Um, I, I am personally fencing off one day every month to engage directly with industry, right? And so I believe it is a PEO's personal responsibility to engage and give feedback and answer those types of questions. And so, so I, I take personal responsibility in that, Jason. So, so however we can improve, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. And please, please don't, don't be shy about, uh, about directly reaching out, okay? Well, I think the times have been very successful. I mean, we're the really direct result of engagement. But, you know, the thing is, it's the, you guys are doing a good job. It's just getting it some other places, more feedback, more anything. Because I feel like it has been very good. Those times have been exceptional at that dialogue. So I want to give credit there and say I've been, you know, that has been very beneficial for industry. When, and I think one of the things IEWS does really well is the alt industry engagements, right? And so you, you, it helps industry determine what is real, what is changing, what are the solicitations that are coming. And so I think, I know C3T is going to evolve to that. I don't know, John Borger, if you want to talk about that real quick. Yeah, it's the same. And we do the same thing. We dedicate, uh, where's the XO? He, he knows every, you know, a, a Tuesday a month, right? And it's it's kind of like a mini version of this. I joke and call it vendor speed dating. And we, I mean, just back to back, half hour blocks all day and take a little 30 minutes for lunch. And, and but that's the means to, you know, in my mind, that's the way to get you the feedback. And we have a cl close relationship with Joe um, when it comes to those types of things. So we try to stay in tune with what he's looking at, see where that maps to where we may be going and uh, understanding any possible transition. Um, so we try to stay in sync on that when it comes to that. But if, but if we're blaming anybody around here, blaming Joe is perfectly fine. Does have a question? Please pass the mic to the most important person in the room. The mic's coming over to you. So, so, so Dave Lockhart, I don't know if you've talked about this one. I think it's come out uh, at least in the press. The idea of the sensors, the deep sensing CFT. And so, the question I would have is, as I see the network CFT. Uh, and the second EW side getting closer, Task Force ISR. How does that new CFT, the sensing CFT, relate to the larger IWMS portfolio, and then the network CFT, and the and the uh, uh, just how this whole network comes together? So I'll speak to our part, but you're actually kind of, uh, Mike Monteleone might be a little upset because that is literally the topic tomorrow for our, uh, our session when it comes to, you know, how we're going to tie in with that. So, but the reality is, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, our relationship with the CFT and with the, with the APNT CFT, as well as the ISR task force has never been stronger. Um, the reality is this is just an, uh, in, in our mind, just an escalation of that codifying the relationship a little bit more. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot more opportunities, uh, you know, you know, for you know the, the levels of interaction. Um, you know, I was on the original one of the original plank holders for the network CFT as we kind of stood that up, and so we're going to be you know proud to be a part of that and, and helping Mike as the material provider as you know a portion of that. We're you know, we're assuming so, um, but as to the network, I would have to. 
And, and because the network underpins most of that, obviously we're going to be working very, very closely together to ensure the requirements that are set there uh, meets the needs to what needs to, the outcome needs to be from the network itself. So that'll be a great relationship along with the PEOC 3T. I think that was the last question they told us to take. We got the hook back there, but I just wanted to tell everybody, thanks so much. We'll be up here if you want to talk to us offline. I appreciate everybody coming by and uh, just spending some time with us. Thank you so much.